Ja. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our uh, event today. Um, my name is Margaret Whitby and I'm from the Border and Protocol Delivery Group. And first of all, I'm delighted to say that our event will be opened by Her Excellency, the Ambassador to Sweden, um, Elizabeth Goff, Elizabeth, if I could, oh, Judith Goff, sorry, bear with me. <laughs> Judith, if I could hand over to you, thank you very much. Thank you. I, I quite prefer Elizabeth, actually. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I will. I, maybe I'll stick with that going forwards. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Um, and a huge thank you uh, also to the Border and Protocol Delivery Group in the UK and also for the Department of International Trade and all of our teams uh, across the Nordic Baltic region. Uh, and of course, those of you who are also uh, in Switzerland. Uh, this uh, is part of a series of events to help uh, businesses across the region prepare for the end of the transition period on the 31st of December. Uh, there will be more events, um, just to uh, flag on the 15th of December, there will be an event and there'll be more information on this uh, on short straights. And on the 16th of December, uh, there will also uh, be an event, an event for those who use direct routes into the UK. Now, the aim of today is really to help you in your preparations for the end of the transition period uh, and for the start of the new world on the 1st of January. Uh, we will be covering, amongst other things, customs procedures, transit, tax, VAT, labelling. Um, and there will also be additional information and an additional session for those of you operating in EE or EFTA countries. Um, I want to be clear about what today is not about, uh, if I may just up front please. Today is not about uh, discussing uh, the merits of Brexit or EU exit. Um, we're perfectly happy to do that, uh, but not in this fora. Um, I think there are other opportunities to debate uh, the pros and to debate the pros and cons. Um, it's also not about getting into speculation as to whether we will have a deal or no deal uh, over the next couple of days. Uh, what I can say is that Prime Minister Boris Johnson will be having dinner in Brussels this evening with President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, I'm not going to second guess uh, what comes out of that. Um, and I think uh, obviously that will become much clearer uh, over the next couple of days. Um, in some ways, uh, that's not too much of an issue because regardless of whether we have a negotiated outcome or a non-negotiated outcome, i.e. a deal or no deal, Things are going to change regardless of whether we get a deal or not. Uh, there will be additional friction uh, at our borders. Um, now, I want to also be clear um, that we are also seeing additional friction because of COVID. And I think it's really important to distinguish between what we're seeing as a result of EU exit going forwards and what we're seeing as a result of a set of unprecedented uh, challenges from a global pandemic, uh, which have challenged us all uh, over the past uh, year. So there are things that you need to be doing now, regardless of whether we have that deal uh, or not over the coming week. Um, from our contacts, uh, we know uh, that many of you are prepared. Um, however, I think we do have some concerns that it is much more challenging for smaller and medium enterprises. Uh, we're trying to spread the word and please um, do help us spread the word to ensure that everybody is doing what they need to do in order to be ready uh, for the 1st of January. Um, finally, uh, I just want to be really clear uh, about one thing. Um, the UK really values its relationships with the Nordic Baltic countries and with Switzerland. Uh, we really want to see f trade flows being as smooth as possible. Uh, we know there will be some additional friction, but we're working very hard to make those trade flows as smooth as possible. We want to continue the fruitful trading relationships that we have with this part of the world. Uh, and we want to make sure uh, that we get through this uh, in the best shape that we possibly can. I think undoubtedly there will be some teething problems, um, but embassies across the network, our DIT teams, that's our Department for International Trade teams, all stand ready to help. And we've also been talking with governments and agencies 
uh, across the network in terms of the support and the information that they're providing. Uh, and we will obviously give you a lot of information today, but I think it's also important to say there's a lot of information uh, available uh, from governments and agencies in your own countries uh, as well in terms of the procedures uh, that you will need to follow. So I will stop there and hand back uh, to Margaret uh, and the experts uh, in the UK. You will have an opportunity uh, to listen what they have to tell you. Uh, there will be also an opportunity to put your questions. We will try and answer as much as we can uh, today, uh, but we will also follow up uh, where we cannot answer those questions today. Uh, and just to conclude that we really do want to make this as seamlessly as seamless as we possibly can. Uh, and thank you once again to all of you uh, for dialing in today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Stella, I think we're coming to you now, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, Ambassador, for your uh, introduction to, uh, to the event today. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this Border and Protocol Delivery Group Virtual Industry Day. And I hope you'll find the event useful and productive. I'm really pleased to note that over 600 people have registered to join us today. And we hope that the event helps you to prepare for the end of the transition period, which is now only weeks away. Um, we're here today to ensure that you're as informed and prepared for the 1st of January next year as possible. Um, we'll talk you through details of the changes to come, and we'll also take you through some operational case studies, which I hope will bring the information to life. We're pleased to be joined today by businesses in the European Economic Area and the European Free Trade Association countries, as well as uh, countries across the Nordic and Baltic uh, area. The UK is working towards a comprehensive free trade agreement with the European Economic Area and the European Free Trade Association, and we have already agreed a trading goods continuity arrangement which will come into force on the 1st of January 2021, because this sits outside the free trade agreement that we are attempting to negotiate with the EU. Today, in addition to covering details about border formalities for trade with the EU, our colleagues from government departments will outline the aspects of trade that will change between the UK and the EEA and EFTA countries from the 1st of January. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, there will be significant challenges for all businesses that trade with Great Britain. We recognise the particular challenge for small and medium businesses to be ready, uh, especially in light of dealing with the impact of COVID. Uh, this is a problem across the UK as well. The end of the transition period means that the UK will be leaving the customs union and the single market, whether or not a free trade agreement is reached. This also means that businesses across the UK and the EU need to prepare for new border controls. And today you'll hear from experts from UK government departments to talk through the implementation of these controls in detail. Could I have the next slide, please? Additional infrastructure will be required at UK ports to carry out checks to handle transit movements and potentially for traffic management. Where ports don't have the capacity, new infrastructure is being built inland. The UK government announced a port infrastructure fund to support UK ports to build facilities wherever possible. And the map on the left shows the intended inland sites and is published in the border operating model. The details of when the sites are actually open and operational will be published very shortly. Could I have the next slide, please? For most of Great Britain, ports have indicated that they'll enlarge or add to their current infrastructure by building additional capacity for carrying out transit, CITES, security and regulatory checks, as well as for operating border control posts. For the short straits, there are a number of inland sites under construction that are planned to be operational in time for the 1st of January. Uh, and in particular for the controls that the UK will be operating from that time, which is not the full uh, regimes. Uh, and there are also additional uh, facilities that will come online by the 1st of July 2021, when the full regimes of uh, physical examination come into force. 
Can I have the next slide, please? We have a busy agenda to get through today, but please do take the opportunity to raise your questions with the experts using the Q&A function. Um, if we don't have time to answer your questions during the live uh, Q&A sessions, then our experts will try to answer your questions online during the course of the event. Any that aren't answered during the event will be dealt with by departments afterwards and the answers shared back via the embassies. I understand that everyone will leave uh, today, uh, hopefully with a better understanding of the preparations that businesses need to make before the 1st of January 2021. And so I'll hand you over to Margaret from my team in Border and Protocol Delivery Group who will facilitate the rest of the event for us. Thank you, Margaret. Hello again, everybody. Good morning. Thank you, Stella. Um, so um, on our next slide, please, uh, we first of all, before we get into presenting uh, lots of detail to you all, we have an ask of you. We've done a number of events across the member states and we have been running polls at these events about how ready businesses are. Um, that is businesses across the supply chain that attend our events. So today is no exception and we would be grateful if those of you who have access to a smartphone or other uh, device as well as watching this webinar um, could access www.slido and complete our short polls for us. We only have three questions for you today um, and the first of these is on the next slide. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the first question is about awareness. How aware are you or your business about the the um, the changes to the way you trade with the UK from the 1st of January? I imagine because so many of you are at this event, um, you will the, the most popular answer will be yes, but grateful if you could join the poll, please, on www.slido and complete that first one. While you're starting that, we'll just show you and talk you through some of the results we've had from previous events. On the next slide, please. So, um, as I said, we've taken these polls at uh, events that we've held across the EU since uh, late August, early September, to just gauge the readiness of businesses. Um, so, on the slide after this, you will be able to see the results from those polls. Um, it's worth pointing out, of course, that the response rates at different events will vary. We're talking to businesses at all stages in the supply chain um, and we're talking to large and small businesses. So there's quite a variation in the results, but there are some trends and they can be seen on the on the next slide. Please. Um, and you can see we've highlighted a previous event, event that we did with much of this audience um, back in September. Um, so we, uh, you can see that the red areas are those that are not aware of what changes they need to make. The orange are people are beginning to get aware of the changes they need to make and the green showing those who have started to take action with the blue end of the graph showing those businesses that say they are ready for the 1st of January. Despite the variation in types of audiences, as you can see, there are some trends there. So work to do, and we hope that today will help to move you all up towards the blue area of the graph. Thank you. And the next slide, please. Um, on to the second question that we have for you this morning. Um, it is about where you are on that readiness journey and feeds into the graph that we showed you earlier. So if you could go on to poll two, please, and choose A, B, C or D. Which of these best describes where you are, how your business is on getting ready for the 1st of January? We leave this poll open as we present the slides and we have one final poll for you at the end of the event. Thank you. If we could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, keeping business moving in the right direction. Um, at this point, as we know, um, and as the ambassador said, uh, it's still uncertain of the trade relationship. Um, we may know more at the end of this week, but what we do know is that customs procedures will apply to trade between the EU and the UK. Paperwork uh, is needed today to transport goods. You'll need um, an invoice perhaps and some uh, contracted carriage for using the ferries or trains or however it is you get your goods to the UK, to and from the UK. But from the 1st of January 2021, whatever happens in the negotiations, um, up to nine additional documents 
and uh, procedures will be required depending on the sorts of goods you're moving and your role in the supply chain. So it's important that everybody understands the formalities that they're going to have to meet at the border in the EU and um, in the UK. Of course, everything starts with an export declaration. The goods will be leaving um, the EU or UK and traveling in the other direction. So the first stage on the journey is an export declaration. In the next slide, please. We've published a lot of information um, in the UK on gov.uk. Um, it's, it's full of everything you need, but we, there's a couple of areas to point you towards. Um, as a starter, we've published the border operating model. Um, it was first published in July and updated in uh, uh, October. And we will be updating it as and when necessary. Um, but it is available on gov.uk. It's got a lot of detail in it and it covers um, some nice, it has a lot of flow charts in it. It also covers and points uh, businesses towards EU, key EU websites for port facilities and so on in Annex A and B. It covers air freight um, and it covers the movement of passengers as well as the main body of the border operating model covering the movement of goods. For those of you at an earlier stage of the journey, there are some straightforward import and export guides available on gov.uk. And um, in the last couple of weeks, we have published the Haulier Handbook that contains guides for hauliers, and there is a link to that here. Um, we can post it in the Q&A for the event, um, and that has been translated into a number of languages, so you can choose the, the language that best suits you. Um, the key messages really for businesses are, that they will need to establish and agree their trading terms, their INCO terms and the conditions of that, understanding who is responsible for the movement of goods um, and for what uh, procedures at each stage of the movement. It's important that you review any terms and conditions that you have now with uh, your uh, businesses in GB or the EU and make sure that everybody's clear about who's responsible for things. If something happens, if goods are delayed at the border, for instance, for any reason, who is responsible for um, making sure that they can move on? That is the first stage. Um, the other area we get a lot of questions about still are the need to have EORI numbers. When you need a UK EORI number or when you need an EU EORI number. It's important to think about this, I suppose, in the point of view, if you're interacting with EU systems, you will need an EU EORI number and this will need to be issued by a member state. If you're interacting with systems in the UK, you will need a UK EORI number. That includes importers, exporters and those moving goods such as hauliers. We can come on and take more questions about that and we can certainly share the guidance for you. Um, as I said, hauliers will also need EORI numbers because they will need them to access systems that are um, in GB. They'll need GB EORI numbers for using some of the systems that are in place that my colleagues will talk you through shortly. You can apply now for a UK EORI number on gov.uk. You do not need to be established in the UK to get a, a, an EORI number there. Um, they will start with GB. Um, and you will may have to set up a government gateway account, but as I said, you can do that even if you're not established in the UK. Thank you. Next slide, please. A very stark message, but one we think is important to just get across. Everybody needs to prepare. Everybody at every stage of the supply chain needs to prepare and ensure that they have done what they need to do to get goods out through the border and in through the other border. Um, there's a very clear message coming through. If you don't have the correct documents, you will not be able to move the goods. No documents, no transports. So that's goods going either way. Thank you. Next stage, please. The UK government, of course, recognises that businesses have a lot to deal with this year and um, announced in July that they will take a staged approach to the requirements for imports to Great Britain. This applies only for imports to Great Britain um, and uh, the staged approach is outlined here on this slide, but my colleagues from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs and the Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs will talk you through the details of this. There is a, a, an ability to delay declarations for standard goods. There is no requirement for safety and security declarations for six months for goods coming into GB. And of course, then there is a staged approach to 
the requirements for moving um, food and other products um, and indeed for the inspection of those. But as I said, my colleagues from Her Majesty's Revenue Customs and the Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs will talk you through this detail now shortly. As a very brief overview from me, and I'm delighted now to hand over to um, our colleague from HM Revenue and Customs, um, Flavia Monteno. And Flavia is going to talk us through customs procedures, please. Thank you, Flavia. Thanks, Margaret. Good morning, everybody. Um, can I have the next slide, please? As it has been announced, uh, the UK will be introducing uh, border controls, which will come in effect from the 1st of January um, and then moving into full controls for all goods from the 1st of July 2021. I will go in to cover the detail of that a bit more. Um, the intention is uh, to uh, have borders safe and secure and um, collect the right customs VAT and excise duty and also to ensure that all the UK exports and imports are being treated equally under this new regime. Crucially as well, we're very um, insistent on facilitating uh, flow um, of goods at the border and um, keeping the UK secure through um, due to the policies that we're introducing. So what that means is we're going to uh, have a requirement for safety and security declarations on import being waived for six months and traders importing controlled goods um, such as excise will have to follow full customs requirements from January 2021. So I'll go to talk in a bit more detail about that. Um, just as a reminder that the UK will be joining the Common Transit Convention in its own right. That's from the 1st of January 2021 and will therefore be subject to the requirements of the conventions. Um, next slide, please. For imports, um, we will be requesting import declarations for um, excise goods uh, from the 1st of January, but as for uh, all other goods, uh, they, then there will be simplifications that apply. So we're talking here about non-controlled goods. Um, goods must be pre-lodged in advance of a crossing if you're moving your goods for a listed rural location um, that doesn't have the existing systems or um, using or does if it doesn't use transit. So to facilitate uh, readiness, traders that are moving these non-controlled goods will be able to declare them by making a, a simple entry in their own records. So it's an entry that um, we call a supplementary declaration and um, the information as to what that record entails can also be found in the border operating model. Um, the businesses will be required to keep records of their imports and submit this information to us within the six months of the date when they've imported the goods. So we will not be asking for that declaration in that period of time, um, but you have six months to um, submit that to the uh, required authorities. Also, um, you are able to pay the required duty via duty um, an approved duty deferment account. So that means, again, you have a, a period of time in which um, the customs duty can be waived. Traders moving controlled goods, um, as I've mentioned, like excise, so alcohol, tobacco, uh, will need to make an immediate frontier declaration. And this can be the full or simplified or transit, depending on um, your commercial decision and uh, how you how you move goods from the EU into GB. Next slide, please. For export declarations, um, traders exporting goods will um, from GB to the EU will need to submit export declarations. So the simplifications that I've spoken about in the previous slide do not apply to exports. Um, they will be required to submit safety and security information, which can either be done via a combined export declaration or as a standalone exit summary declaration. And again, for excise goods or goods moving under duty suspense, um, you do, the trader does have to provide a proofed HMRC after the goods have left that they have exited GB. Next slide, please. Um, so just to recap, um, for EU traders, um, there are the following controls that will apply from the 1st of um, January uh, 
there will be a need to start submitting export declarations from the 1st of January to the 1st of July. We'll have a period of um, simplifications in place. Um, and then from the 1st of July, um, there will be a need to, uh, to produce full customs declarations. And we're also encouraging all of the traders to work closely with customs agents um, in order to make sure that they um, are ready for the new controls. Just a caveat that all of this applies to EU member states. If you are um, not an EU member state, so if you're an EA or EFTA country, there will um, all that apply, will apply our rest of world requirements. So the way that we're trading at the moment with the rest of the world will be the same way that we're trading with your countries, unless you have a bilateral free trade agreement signed with the UK. But I will come back to that shortly. Next slide, please. I've mentioned two um, ways to bring in goods. Um, from an imports perspective, you may be able to bring them via pre-lodgement or in temporary storage. We expect that um, pre-lodgement will be um, a very popular platform to use. Um, it's called GVMS uh, abbreviated. This is a, a platform that we're building um, and that we're hoping to have up and running and going live um, imminently. Um, this will be, um, in, it, it's, it's basically a model to ensure that all of the declarations and the data are pre-lodged before they board on the EU side, uh, maintaining flow, especially at high volume um, roll-on, roll-off locations. Bear in mind, a lot of responsibility in terms of the data here would fall to the haulier rather than trader himself or herself. So um, again, a good relationship with the haulier is encouraged in the supply chain. In terms of um, the temporary storage model um, that has existed before for rest of world movements as well. So nothing really changes here. It's just a case of um, another option that allows goods to be stored for up to 90 days in an HMRC approved temporary storage facility before a declaration is made to enable government officials to carry out checks before goods are released from that facility. We think this will apply more to high risk goods um, and that it will not in any way disrupt um, flow of goods at the border. It's simply a case of um, seeing the data that comes in before the goods board, understanding the risk of the goods and then pointing um, the, the haulier to the respective uh, location of the temporary storage facility. So um, that will likely not be the most popular option. Next slide, please. So again, a bit more detail on temporary storage. Um, I will simply stress here that um, for temporary storage, the facilities um, will have to have a lot of obligations, so they'll need to be inventory linked and they'll have to have a connection in the system to um, HMRC's records. Um, but this is more of importance to um, the ports rather than the traders. So um, I suggest we move on to the next slide. Next slide, please. As I've mentioned before, the UK will be entering the Common Transit Convention Again, this is a way to allow the movement of goods um, under duty suspense to move between EU member states and some neighbouring countries, including EFTA countries. Um, the UK will exceed in its own right on the 1st of January um, and we will be effectively uh, bound by the terms of the convention from then. Um, there are um, a couple of things to bear in mind here. This allows the suspension of customs checks and payments of duties until the goods reach the Office of Destination and um, the Office of Departure and Destination functions can be completed at a customs office or an approved uh, location, which we call consignor or consignee. Um, and also the Office of Transit functions are a requirement placed on CTC members. But again, this is nothing um, totally new, probably for an EA EFTA audience, given that your trade is very likely already move goods in this way. Next slide, please. I've mentioned the Goods Vehicle Movement, Movement Service, GVMS. This is basically a platform 
that is being designed and will be rolled out very shortly to ensure that we can operationalize the, the steps I've mentioned before on pre-lodgement and transit. So it's basically an IT platform that will support the pre-lodgement model for both imports and exports and will also facilitate transit movements. So if you decide to move goods under the pre-lodgement model, um, there, there, are, there, is, um, there will be an imminent announcement on gov.uk about the uh, gateway portal that the haulier will need to use. So um, please do keep an eye out for that. Effectively, what this will be, it will um, be a platform that enables all of the declaration references to be linked together, and it will allow the linking of the movement of the goods to the declarations, thus automatizing the arrival um, of the goods in the systems of HMRC as soon as the goods are bored so that the declarations can be processed en route. So it doesn't stop it doesn't stop the haulier, it doesn't require the trader to stop goods um, en route. It will also automate the Office of Transit function, again available from the 1st of January, by marking the entry of goods into GP Customs territory. Um, there's also a system um, notification that is embedded in the platform, um, which will notify the risking outcome of declarations. So it will enable HMRC to gauge how risky the goods are, and it will um, therefore provide a notification to the haulier as to whether the goods have been cleared or uncleared in our systems. Um, so, and they, whether they can be sent to the person in control of the goods or on their way to the final destination. Next slide, please. Next. Um, that's just a little bit more information on hauliers. I will not linger on this too much. So, um, next slide, please. This is a bit of a visual um, on how this will work in practice. Uh, GVMS will basically um, have a, a very simple portal at the beginning uh, where it's the responsibility of the haulier to put in all the relevant data, and that can be data linked to the declarations, obviously import safety and security transit. It will also require him to input data about um, the vehicle so that we're able to synchronize the vehicle moving the goods with the respective declarations that have been made. If it's a multi-load vehicle, then we'll be asking for um, more information on each of the loads. Um, and again, we'll be trying to synchronize that in the system with the respective declarations um, to make sure that from a risk perspective, we have all the data to hand. All of that will be um, joined up as a single uh, movement reference number and it will uh, proceed to the next stage where it will have to be validated by our systems, depending on whether you're using um, pre-lodgement um, or whether you're using transit. In any case, this will be automated and um, the goods will be going through a risking process. And then um, that will also capture and verify the vehicle registration number um, well, via the officers at the border, but ideally, it will, all the information will, will have arrived in the system before the goods reach the border. Finally, um, the risking will be carried out by HMG um, on declaration, so all of the data will need to be double checked. And the haulier will receive a status update notification um, that will confirm whether the goods have been cleared or uncleared. Next slide, please. Once again, the same process applies for exports. Um, to avoid congestion, we will have to ensure that um, any hauliers that enter incorrect declaration references into their GMR envelope will receive a message not to proceed to the port until the valid reference is entered. Again, this is something that we're stressing um, is an important step and will prevent um, any sort of unnecessary delays. We do have the right to refuse boarding to vehicles that have an invalid goods movement reference. Um, but as I've said before, it's very unlikely this will be the case because we are ensuring that hauliers that enter an incorrect one will simply receive that message that they are not able to proceed. We would also um, ask that you familiarize yourself with this platform once it goes live this month. Um, and especially your hauliers who will have to input all of the information into the platform. Um, if you're actually 
intending to benefit from any of the easements that apply on import, then um, that will, there will also be a way for you to do that via the platform. Um, next slide, please. Just a quick announcement on VAT. Um, so from the 1st of January, postponed VAT accounting will be available to VAT registered businesses for imports of goods, and that includes from the EU. And um, traders are not compelled to do that unless they import non-controlled goods and either choose to delay their supplementary customs declarations or to use um, the simplified customs declaration process and simply make an entry in the declarence records. And the key questions we keep getting is um, if you can register for a URI number in GB without being registered for a VAT number. Yes, they are different accounts. So you can register for a URI without having a GB VAT account. Next slide, please. On excise, I've already mentioned from the 1st of January, rest of world will, rules will apply to imports and exports of excise goods. Um, moving, moving from a GB to the EU. So that means full customs declarations will be required and um, also any um, additional data that you're usually required to put in for excise um, through the excise movement and control system. So UK EMCS, which is the system we use to track excise goods. This system must also be used um, to move any duty suspended excise goods from a UK warehouse to another warehouse. So just to bear that in mind. Next slide, please. Now I've mentioned that for EEA countries, rest of world rules will apply unless they've signed a bilateral trade agreement with the UK. For example, Switzerland has signed one um, and this is all available on gov.uk. The aspects of that bilateral will therefore inform how we trade with the respective country and the tariff rates for bilateral trading goods will continue to apply as soon as the agreement takes effect. Um, in, mo in some cases, non-preferential uh, non applied rates may in fact be lower because of changes um, to the WTO's and UK's most favoured nation, nation tariff schedule, which can also be found on gov.uk. For goods transited um, through the EU and any other country with whom accumulation is applicable, and these will not be subject to the same restrictions as those in transit for other third countries. So, for example, you'd still be able to split a consignment in the EU when exporting goods to Switzerland, provided that the goods comprising the consignment have not cleared customs in the EU. Businesses would also need to fill a certificate of origin to claim preferential treatment unless permitted to provide an origin declaration. Next slide, please. It's also worth stressing that the UK has agreed a continuity trade agreement with Norway and Iceland, again taking effect from the 1st of January. Um, just as before, the tariff rates for bilateral trading goods will continue to apply as soon as the agreement takes effect. Um, in the meantime, uh, we will be uh, obviously bound by transition period terms. There will also be existing rules of origin that will apply, so EU content can count as originating um, as long as processing in that exporting country, so be it the UK, Norway or Iceland, if the content beyond goes beyond what we call sufficient. Um, insufficient processing of very minor activities like repacking or sorting. So if the content goes beyond that, then it counts as originating from the exporting country and will fall under the conditions and the terms of the trade agreement. Next slide, please. Right. I think that's back to you, Margaret. Thank you, Thank very, you much, very much, Flavia. Flavia. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm getting a bit of echo. Let's see if we're good. Um, uh, we have a number of questions in the chat. Um, we're starting, or uh, in the Q&A, I should say, we're starting to um, post some answers, but we'd welcome um, uh, your response to some of them, Flavia, please. Um, the first one we had was a... Um, a lot of them relate to EORI numbers, so if we could just run through those first of all. Um, the first one I have picked up is a transporting about transporting companies. Um, they will need UK EORI numbers even if the exporter or importer are doing the declarations. Is that correct? To interact, they'll need them to interact with GVMS systems and so on. 
Is that yeah, right? That's right. Thank so you. because they're a party to moving goods, they will need a UK ERA number. Lovely, thank you. Um, the other question we had was about EORI numbers, using EORI numbers on um, declar declarations, courier declarations. So for instance, for e-commerce parcels and so on, should the EORI number be included in declarations there? Yes, again, the EORI number should be included if um, the goods are meant for uh, the UK for import or export. So there is, there is a way to do that also for e-commerce. Lovely, thank you. There's a, a, a form or a box on the form, is that right? If I put it like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have a question about um, a, a, fair, a customs agent based in Poland who has um, a customs comprehensive guarantee issued by uh, Polish authorities and uses transit. They want so they're moving goods. Um, through GB and EU using transit. Um, will the, first of all, the first question is, will the Polish Customs Comprehensive Guarantee cover this, the um, company to start movements, transit movements in GB? And the second question is, will they need a GB EORI number? So on the second one, yes. Um, on the first one, can you just repeat it? <laughs> so they have a Customs Comprehensive Guarantee issued yeah. um, in Poland. Um, yeah. And they may want to start transit movements in Great Britain. So presumably they can use the Polish Customs Comprehensive Guarantee for that movement, or do they have to have a separate one? Um, let me just double check that. My understanding is they can, um, but it depends on whether they're intending or the trader is intending to defer duty. In that case, I think there are certain easements that apply. Um, so let me get back to you with a fuller answer um, on the Q&A, if that's OK. OK, we will flag that and, and share that answer with you. Thank you. Um, the question we had, another question we had um, moving on from Iori numbers now, I think um, we can come back to them if there are more later. Um, but could you confirm whether the staged approach to uh, GB imports applies to just the EU or does it include EEA EFTA countries? It's just for the EU. Um, so this is part of our um, negotiations with the EU. And as I've caveated during the presentation for EA and EFTA, different rules will apply if we've signed a bilateral free trade agreement um, or continuity trade agreement, whatever you like to call it, those rules will come into effect. If you haven't signed one, it's rest of world processes, basically. Lovely, thank you. Um, we've had a number of questions about the GVMS system. Um, I think that people are keen to get access and see it. Um, I think there are some, there is a link that we can post to the development site that gives them information. But um, Flavia, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is going live this week, isn't it? For, um, yes. And there are different dates for depending on whether you GB or your number. If you could run us through how people. That's right. So the, the, the original um, date was supposed to be yesterday. So um, basically, yeah, this week is really the announcement um, that is going to, to go live in terms of um, in terms of access. Or is there another question on how it will work? Is that right? I think it's just I think it's um, people would welcome, I think, a link to where they can go to look at how the service will work. Um, there's a couple of questions about the type of software used, and I think this link answers all of those. And then there was um, a, a question about getting access so if you were yeah. a an EU based business, can you get access to it this week? Um, so it will be called the government gateway account. It's really mm. the portal will be available for hauliers rather than for traders. Um, mm. The trader really shouldn't be interacting at all with the portal because we're basically asking things like trade for things like trailer movements. So. Um, you need things like the correct vehicle registration number for accompanied movements or a trailer registration number for unaccompanied movements. So these things will be things that um, that the haulier will know. So um, what we would encourage you to do is actually to um, direct hauliers in that direction. And if you're not sure, then again, working with a customs agent would be quite helpful because they usually um, have a bit of a kind of broader look on the whole system and they will able they will be able to speak. Um, with hauliers as well and explain any kind of um, uh, details that they need to be aware of. In terms of interaction, so the system will be interacting with HMRC systems, so um, you know it, it would still interact with things like Chief, um, CDS on the other side. 
Um, but uh, that's again probably not you know immediately for you to worry about. It's more um, when the Holia inputs the data, that data gets processed and risked on our end. So the IT platform communicates with HMRC systems and crucially provides a notification of the risking outcome. So that's really what we're trying to do, simplify things in one goods movement reference and also provide a notification of the risk of the um, the outcome of declarations. So whether they've been cleared or uncleared. Um, in terms of the link, yeah, happy to happy to share that and more of the information can be found found um, on gov.uk about how it will work. But just to stress again, it's for hauliers and the system will be on gov.uk. It should be very easy to use um, and really isn't very complicated in terms of the asks. Lovely. Thank you. If you could post that link for us in the Q&A, that would be great. Thank you. Um, we have a question across about movement of goods into GB before the 1st of January and the movement over midnight. I wonder if you could just talk us through the UK position on goods that um, are already in the UK before midnight and then what happens to those who start their movement but don't arrive till after midnight on the 1st sure. of January. So, so the question, UK thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, the UK position on this is um, quite straightforward. If the goods made the departure before midnight, um, so th that would count as uh, a normal movement under the current terms and conditions. So it's an EU movement to GB uh, with no customs checks applicable because we're still in transition. Um, you would need a proof of status of goods. So we highly recommend um, that the haulier uh, retains uh, proof of status or the driver, whoever brings the goods into the country, as that's something that we may be asking for as, um, as, as proof of that journey having started before the end of transition. So something that constitutes proof might be um, like a CMR, which is a consignment note, um, with which would confirm that the carrier has received the goods and the contract of carriage exists between the trader and carrier. So we'd still be bound by um, the UCC at that point. So we'd, we'd accept um, that as, as proof of status and proof of um, goods moving, moving. And no customs checks would apply if the goods have moved, um, started to move to the UK on the journey before midnight. Post midnight, um, we'll start having different rules in place, which I've just explained through the slide deck. So post midnight, you'd start having um, UK specific rules. Um, so we'd no longer be bound by the transition period terms. OK, thank you very much. Um, and just one more thing, I, 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 and I can see there are still questions coming in, so we will come back to them later in the plenary session. But just for now, Flavia, um, there's a question about transit again. Um, can we just confirm that the UK um, GB has signed up to the Common Transit Convention so there won't be a need to to stop goods at the border if they're moving under transit and then enter into another um, system, another no, customs right. procedure? Then. Yeah, is that that's correct. correct. So uh, we will only be, um, because it, it is under the CTC, so it's how it would work. It's obviously the um, Office of Transit, so the final location where those checks would would be taking place if necessary, but ideally we'd have all the information um, en route. Um, so as with normal CTC movements, really, that's how we would treat them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'd be delighted if you could stay with us and um, keep an eye on the Q&A and answer questions you can and maybe join us again at the plenary session. Um, the other questions that we're getting a lot of, I can see at the moment, are about tariffs. So uh, my colleagues are posting the links to the guidance on gov.uk about the tariffs for um, uh, the UK tariffs system and that will allow you to choose the commodity and the country and so on and you'll be able to also link off to see where we have free trade agreements, what the tariffs will be there and the alternative tariffs. So I hope that helps but uh, thank you very much and if we can move on to the next slide now I'm delighted to say that we're joined by Duncan Lawson from the Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs um, and uh, Duncan will also be joined by the uh, uh, Jiao from the Food Standards Agency and they're going to talk us through moving SPS and controlled goods. Um, a lot of detail to go through so um, Duncan if I can hand over to you, thank you very much. Thank you Margaret, uh, hi and good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Duncan Lawson, I'm the head of the EU engagement team in DEFRA which is uh, Food and Rural Affairs. 
I have to concede this is a long slide pack to accompany this presentation and it will be made available to you at the end and it's got a lot of information on a huge number of commodities. Um, we don't have time to cover all of these, so we'll focus on the changes to the SPS regime, packaging, labeling and a bit on chemicals. I think it's fair to say that there are still details to be settled and in some places we know the technology and processes will not be in place for the 1st of January, but we can tell you what we do know and give you a sense of how we see it working. Again, uh, you'll receive a copy of the slide pack afterwards, uh, which I hope will address any questions you have. However, before beginning, I should make clear that when I talk about GB, I'm referring to England, Wales and Scotland. Northern Ireland has different arrangements. So moving on, uh, next slide please. Can we have them? There we go. OK, uh, unfortunately, I need to do some. I need to use some technical language here uh, because new sanitary and phytosanitary controls will apply to goods exported into GB from the EU from the 1st of January next year. As touched on earlier, these are being introduced in three main stages between January to July, with different controls being introduced at each stage for different commodities. All the changes will be announced in advance and information is available on the .gov UK website. I suggest you follow this site closely. As well as announcing changes and details of the rules, it also has links where you can access the documents that you'll need. Uh, for example, uh, the controls being introduced will include a pre -import, an import pre-notification, health certification, documentary ID and physical checks and from next July entry through a point of entry uh, with a border control post with relevant check-in facilities. Uh, next, next slide please. Uh, on plants and plant products uh, from the 1st of January there'll be a requirement for pre-notification and phytosanitary certificates for high priority plants and plant products. A list of what high priority means uh, is available at gov.uk. A link is in the presentation that you'll get. However, as an example, the list details all plants for planting, where and some seed potatoes, some timber, and used agricultural and forestry machinery. Also, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for solid fuel wood that is not otherwise regulated, a phytosanitary certificate will not be required, but you will need to pre notify. From next April, the requirement for pre-notification and phytosanitary certificates is extended to all regulated plants and plant products. Uh, we've published a list of commodities that are not regulated on the website. Uh, if the commodity is not mentioned on that list, then it will need certificates. From next July, there will be an increased number of physical and identity checks at border control posts. Uh, next slide, please. So in summary, from the 1st of January, pre-notification and certificates will be required for high priority plants and plant products with checks carried out remotely. Physical checks will be carried out on high priority plants which are not subject to systemic import checks now, but constitute high risk pathways. These will take place at destination or other authorised premises. EU exporters will need to apply for phycosanitary certificate for the relevant competent authority of the country of origin. You will need this before the goods departure so it can be sent to the importer for pre-notification purposes. Importers will need to submit import notifications at least four hours prior to arrival if travelling by air or at least one working day prior to arrival by all other modes of transport along with phytosanitary certificates. Next slide please. from the 1st of April. All regulated plants and plant products will require pre-notification and to be accompanied by a PS certificate. And from July, physical checks for plant products and plants will increase. Those subject to SPS controls will need to enter via a point of entry with a border control post and relevant checking facilities. All ID and physical checks for plants and their products will move to border control posts either at existing points of entry or new inland sites. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide deals with a couple of uh, regular questions we have. Uh, what do the physical checks actually look like? Uh, well, 
they'll take place away from the border and will be physically checked for evidence of the presence of harmful pests and diseases. Will there be additional charges? Yes, there will, uh, as is the case for imports from non-EU countries now. Uh, will the changes affect imports from countries outside the EU? A common import regime will ultimately apply to all third countries, so any changes will apply equally to the EU and non-EU countries. Next slide, please. Moving on to animals. Again, the changes are phased between January and July. From the 1st of January, pre-notification and health certificates will be required for all live animals. This must be submitted at least one working day before arrival at the point of entry. Any product of animal origin subject to safeguard measures will need to be pre-notified and accompanied by the relevant health certificate. For live animals, or POAO, with safeguard measures, the GB importer will provide a unique notification number that is generated when they raise the pre-notification. This number must be entered onto the health certificate. As the exporter, you will be responsible for ensuring the relevant health certificate travels with the consignments. Animal byproducts will continue to uh, will continue with the requirement to be accompanied by official commercial documentation. High risk animal byproducts will require the importer to pre authorize and high risk animal byproducts and category three processed animal protein will require pre notification in advance. More information on what constitutes a high risk animal byproduct can be found in the border operating model. Next slide, please. From the 1st of April, all products of animal origin will require pre notification via IPAFs, which stands for the Import of Products, Animals, Food and Feed Systems. This is the system which GB importers must use to pre notify SPS imports, and I'll speak more about that in a moment. The GB importer must make notification to IPAFs as the exporter. Again, you will be required to obtain the relevant health certification and ensure that it travels with the consignment. The process is introduced on the 1st of January for live animals, high risk animal byproducts and products of animal origin subject to safeguard measures will continue until July. Next slide, please. From the 1st of July, all live animals and products of animal origin will require pre-notification using IPAFs and must be accompanied by an EHC. And they will be required to enter via an established point of entry with an appropriate border control post with checking facilities. Animal byproducts must be accompanied by an EHC or other official documentation. Certain animal byproducts will need to arrive by an established point of entry with an appropriate border control post, and certain animal byproducts will require pre notification. Again, as the EU exporter, you will need to ensure the correct documentation travels with the consignments. Identity and physical checks for products of animal origin and animal byproducts will also be introduced. All ID and physical checks for animal products will move to the border control posts, either at existing points of entry or at new inland sites. Products of animal origin, germinal products and animal byproducts imported from the EU will be subject to a minimum level of 1% physical checks. All high risk live animals will continue to be checked. Some, such as shellfish and certain animal byproducts, will be subject to higher minimum check levels. These measures will be reviewed over the course of the year. Any further changes will be introduced after January 2022. Next slide, please. On to fisheries. Um, existing import rules will apply for imports of fishery products and live bivalve mollusks for human consumption until April. However, catch certificates and other IIU documents will be subject to checks from January. From April, fishery products and live bivalve mollusks for human consumption will be subject to import controls in line with those applying to animal products. From April, there will also be a requirement for importers to pre-submit pre-notifications for fisheries products through IPAFs 
in advance of the goods arrival in the same way as products of animal origin. EU flagged vessels will not be able to continue landing live bivalve mollusks as direct landings into GB. These will need to be imported under appropriate health certificates. From July 21, fisheries products will be subject to import controls, including an EHC, import pre-notifications, and entry via an established point of entry with an appropriate border control post. Different rules apply for direct landings. Most imports of marine caught fish and some shellfish will need a validated catch certificate to be sent to the importing competent authority prior to the goods arrivals. Live aquatic animals for aquaculture and ornamental purposes will also be subject to import controls applying to live animals. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, I said I would come back to the IT system. The new system for GB importers to pre-notify SPS imports is IPAFs. This is already live and is being used for some commodities alongside traces. From 2021, IPAFs will be used to pre-notify UK officials and other official bodies before goods subject to SPS controls enter GB from the EU in a phased approach, starting with live animals, germinal products and animal byproducts. Next slide, please. Put simply, IPAFs will replace traces for GB importers. Again, there will be a phased migration. IPAFs is already in place for live animals, animal byproducts and germinal products for the EU and EEA countries. Products of animal origin, high risk food and feed not of animal origin will start from 1st of April. Plant and plant products will likely be introduced from the 1st of February, but we need to confirm that date. That's not certain yet. You should be aware that IPAFs will go live for non-EU and non-EEA countries at different dates. Next slide, please. Ah, this is this is a new slide for the presentation covering EEA and EFTA. So for animals and their products where EEA and EFTA countries are harmonized with EU standards, the phasing of SPS import controls will be carried out in line with EU countries. For commodities not harmonized with EU standards, the current SPS control arrangements from January 21 will continue. The process for importing animals and animal products from the EU outlined in the border operating model apply fully to Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Norway, as they are harmonized with the EU SPS standards. More specific information on the harmonization of individual commodities from other EEA and EFTA countries will be available shortly. In summary, if your product currently is not harmonized with EU SPS standards, current SPS control arrangements will continue. If your commodity is harmonized with EU SPS standards, you will need to follow the EU to GB phased approach for importing these products. The process for importing plants and plant products into GB from the EU outlined in the border operating model apply to Switzerland, Liechtenstein, but not Iceland, Greenland or the Faroe Islands. Next slide, please. OK, so let's look at SPS measures for GB exports to the EU. GB exporters must pre notify on traces and upload a copy of the export health certificate. You should ensure that the GB exporter sends the original export health certificate. That's very important. GB exporters can obtain the health certificates via EHC online. These should be completed by an official veterinarian or food competence certifying officer who will verify the health conditions outlined the EU regulations are met. More information on these certificates can be found out on the gov.uk website. You should plan for logist your logistic provider to enter the EU through a border control post. A border control post should be notified by an EU based importer or import agent prior to arrival. For live animals, that notification needs to happen at least 24 hours in advance of arrival. Next slide, please. For aquatic for live aquatic animals, you should plan for the logistic provider to enter the EU again through an appropriate border control post and the post should be notified by an EU-based importer or import agent prior to arrival. 
For live animals, this should be at least 24 hours in advance and any CITES permits should be obtained before shipment. Live aquatic animals such as ornamental fish and certain live bivalve mollusks need to be certified by a fish health inspector in either the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science in England and Wales or Marine Scotland. This is again the difference between uh, different parts of the UK. Um, these organisations also provide relevant EHCs and other certificates will be provided by the Animal and Plant Health Agency via EHC online. Next slide please. For the export of fishery products and live shellfish from GB to EU, you need to use an appropriate border control post. Again, the GB based exporter will need to pre-notify the EU using Traces NT. The consignment must be accompanied by an EHC, which is the responsibility of the GB exporter and completed by the local authority certifying officer. The GB exporter will need to send the UK validated catch certificate along with a copy of the EHC to the EU importer. Direct landings of fresh fish by UK flag vessels do not require an EHC, but will need to complete catch certificates and other notifications prior to landing as required. Direct landing of processed fish must be in a port with a border control port for fish and presented with a captain's certificate. Next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. To summarise, the EHC online service will be used to control the export of live animals, products of animal origin, bees, endangered species, plants and plant products. This system allows exporters to apply for export health certificates and PS certificates online. It is already live and has been rolled out to replace the largely manual rest of the world export health certificate process. From January, the EU will require GB exporters to have an EHC or and uh, PS certificates. This can be these can be applied for using EHC online, except for EHCs for aquatic animals, which are from the Centre for Environment, Fisheries, Aquaculture, Science and Marine and, and, and Science and Marine Scotland. From the 1st of January, for English, Scottish and Welsh traders will be able to apply for most of their health certificates and PS certificates from EHC online. Traders will need to complete an EHC for each type of animal or animal product exported from the UK. Next slide, please. <coughs> uh, it's at this point my voice usually begins to break down, so uh, please bear with me here. Uh, we will now move on to food labelling changes for food marketed in the UK. We will uh, we will be updating the guidance on changes required from the 1st of January on the Gov UK website. The link is available in the presentation. The changes we're making in GB include origin labelling requirements around business responsible for food information and the use of logos and health marks. <coughs> Excuse me. The period of adjustment will be for 21 months until the 30th of September 2022. Goods sold in Northern Ireland will continue to follow EU rules for labelling, but you may need to make some labelling changes. For food placed onto the EU market from Great Britain, I'd encourage you to read the link in this slide entitled Withdrawal of the UK and EU, and EU Food Law. Based on this EU notice, UK businesses will need to make some changes in order to place food on the EU market when the transition period ends. Next slide, please. For pre-packed food, the rules, the rules change on food business operator addresses from January 2021. From this time, the address on pre-packed food should be the address of the food operator in the UK, or if they're not established in the UK, you can use the address of the food importer. To help with this transition, we have amended the law until so that until September 2022, you can use an EU address of either a food business operator established in the EU, or if the FBO is not established in EU, you can use the address of the importer of food. <coughs> Excuse me. 
From the 1st of October 22, you will need a UK address. That's very important. Where both a UK and EU address are used, the label will be acceptable in both markets. Pre-packed food or casings sold in Northern Ireland must include a Northern Ireland or EU FBO address from the 1st of January. If the FBO is not in Northern Ireland or the EU, include the address of your importer based in Northern Ireland or the EU. Next slide, please. Certain foods, including most fresh and frozen meat, honey and olive oil, are required to have origin labels. When the ingredient is from more than one country, regulations allow the origin to be summarised using non-country specific terms or origin indicators. Please refer to the guidance on GovUK to see what is required on the GB market after the 1st of January. This is in the presentation you'll be given. But to briefly summarise, food from and sold in GB can be labelled as origin EU until the 30th of September 22. From then on, it can't. For goods marketed in Northern Ireland, food from GB must not be labelled origin EU from the 1st of January 21. Food from and sold in Northern Ireland can continue to use origin EU from the 1st of January 2021. Next slide, please. Covering UK food on the EU market, the intellectual property of the EU organic logo is owned by the EU, so the UK will not meet the requirements. The UK is aiming to be recognised by the EU as having an equivalence to organic standards and establish, a, uh, establish reciprocal arrangements. If agreement is reached, the use of the EU logo will be allowed on an optional basis as it is now. Similarly, an e the EU emblem must not be used on UK produced goods except where the ongoing use has been authorised by the EU. GB products of animal origin exported to the EU 27 countries must carry the GB or UK on the health and identification marks. The food business operator is the business under whose name the food is marketed. The requirement to be established means that the FBO has a physical presence in the EU 27. A label carrying the address of the FBO based in the UK and the EU will ensure the address requirements are met for both markets. Next slide, please. All uh, this is onto organics now. Uh, all imports from third countries, including the EU, must be accompanied by a GB certificate of inspection. From the 1st of January, we will use a paper-based import system for all imports. This will be replaced with an electronic system when available. Importers need to make sure that all organic imports from third countries meet the requirements laid out in retained commission legislation, which is 1235 of 2008. Consignments that arrive in the GB without an endorsed certificate of inspection will not be cleared as organic. These goods would either need to be relabeled and in doing that, removing the references to organics, re-exported as non-organic or destroyed. DEFRA has published a step-by-step -step guide and an FAQ on importing organic products from third countries into GB at the end of the transition period. Next slide, please. So moving on to geographical indicators, um, the UK government will establish a new UK GI scheme by the 1st of January. There will be four schemes covering food, agricultural products, spirits, wines and aromatised wines. The UK framework will comply with the ETO TRIPS rules uh, and the UK products currently protected under the EU's GI schemes will continue to be protected under the UK GI schemes. The UK GI schemes will welcome applications from both UK and non-UK applicants from the day they enter into force. Next slide, please. Again, we often get questions on GI, so, so preempting these. Uh, the UK will honour our legal obligations under the withdrawal agreement and GI products protected under both the UK and EU schemes will be able to use both UK and EU logos when the when the product is on sale in the UK and in the EU 
unless this is prohibited by EU regulations. Next slide, please. So um, from the 1st of January, all wood packaging material moving either way between the EU and GB must be treated and appropriately marked in compliance to meet the ISPM 15 international standards by undergoing heat treatment and marking. There is a link on the slide that outlines these requirements. These include pallets, crates, boxes, cable drums, spools and dunnage. Next slide, please. The UK timber regulations prohibit the placing of illegally harvested timber on the market and lays out the duties of operators. Operators are required to exercise due diligence to ensure that timber placed on that market has not been harvested illegally. From the 1st of January, operators placing timber on the EU market will have to exercise due diligence on timber from the UK and the rest of the world under the European timber regulations. This includes timber harvested in the UK and timber from third countries placed on the UK market. Likewise, operators placing timber on the UK market will have to exercise due diligence on timber from the EU and the rest of the world under the UK timber regulations. This includes supply chain information. The due diligence required is not new. What has changed is that there will now be an EU market and a UK market. Importers need to check the requirements under the respective timber re regulations and act accordingly. There will be no change for timber from Northern Ireland being placed on the EU market and vice versa. So now I'll leave you with two slides on chemicals. Can I have the next slide, please? From January, GB will replace EU chemicals regulations with a new framework called UK REACH. Importers and manufacturers of chemicals will assume new responsibilities under UK REACH from then. The UK REACH IT system is ready to support the registration of chemicals in the UK from the end of the transition period. The new system retains fundamental principles of EU REACH, including no data, no market principle, the precautionary principle and the last resort principle on animal testing. Although both GB and EU will operate REACH frameworks, the two systems will not be linked in any way. So I have to stress that they will not be linked in any way. So businesses need to ensure that the requirements are fulfilled on both sides of the channel. For exports from the EU into GB, substances must be covered by a valid UK REACH registration in advance of any checks being carried out in the border. For imports into the EU from GB, EU REACH registrations will no longer be valid after the 31st of December. They must be transferred to an EU based legal entity to allow continued import into the EEA. Next slide, please. EU businesses accessing the GB market have two options. The first is that your GB customer uh, register the substance under UK REACH. A notification provision is available for your GP downstream users to ensure the continuity of supply at the end of the transition period. The second is for EEA exporters who can register the substance under UK REACH using a GB based entity. So to conclude, I'm very aware this is an intense day and with another long presentation in which a lot of information has been outlined in less than ideal virtual circumstances. In the time we're allowed, there's no prospect of covering anything in great detail. So I've tried to focus on the areas with the highest traffic and the greatest changes coming into effect from the start of the year. This acknowledges that there are many more areas that I haven't mentioned and where you might have an interest. For those and for more information on the areas I have covered, you should look at the extended slide pack and to the gov.uk website. We have our policy exports available later for the Q&A session. So for the moment, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Duncan. And now, um, Jao, if you'd be able to talk us through high risk food and feed, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, I yeah. can all hear you. Perfect, you. perfect. OK, so uh, next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so um, 
Yeah, uh, I'm an import delivery officer at the uh, Food Standards Agency, and I will now briefly explain the import requirements for high risk food and feed not of animal origin. So first of all, um, what do I mean by uh, high risk FNAO? So this is a term that describes specific non-animal food and feed products that originate from specific non-EU countries where a particular food safety hazard has been identified. Um, so, for example, uh, sweet peppers from Egypt because of, uh, uh, they are tested for pesticide residues or, for example, um, groundnuts from certain countries uh, because of the risk of aflatoxins. Um, you will see in the, in the last slide of my presentation um, a link for uh, a list of the full high risk food and feed of not of animal origin. Uh, and you can see it there. Um, so uh, the high risk food, uh, uh, high risk FNAOs um, don't originate uh, from the EU right now because the, the definition is that they, they, they are from specific non EU countries. Uh, that might change in the future when uh, the responsibility to create that list will fall um, to the uh, UK's uh, authorities, in this case, the Food Standard Agency. Um, finally, uh, so because there are no high risk uh, FNAOs coming uh, from within the EU right now, we are we will be talking uh, specially about um, uh, transits. So high risk FNAOs coming from non EU countries that either uh, travel directly through the EU onto the UK, uh, a direct transit, or indirectly by being first imported into the EU, being checked by, uh, uh, by the EU, and then being uh, re-exported to the UK. Uh, the last note is that uh, it is important uh, uh, that uh, importers, uh, is important to remind you that importers have the responsibility to identify whether the, the um, food or feed uh, of non-animal origin that they are uh, exporting to GB is high risk or not. And that at least, as I said, is in the last uh, slide of my presentation. So in January 2021, the uh, only thing that will change is that um, um, direct transits uh, through the EU uh, destined only for GB uh, will have to uh, be pre-notified on IPAFs and uh, they will also have to enter GB via an appropriately approved border control post. Next slide, please. Um, then in April 2021, um, the uh, rest of the world uh, products that were firstly imported to the EU, checked into the EU, and then re-exported into uh, GB, um, will be required to also have a, uh, have a pre-notification on IPAFs. Next slide. Finally, in July 2021, uh, whole, all high-risk food and feed uh, of non-animal origin uh, will have to enter GB v, uh, via uh, PCP with a relevant approval and of course having first been pre-notified on IPAPs and will be subject to import controls. Uh, this will include um, uh, high-risk FNAO that has, has been imported into the EU, being checked by the EU and then um, re-exported to uh, GB. Um, this is also important to uh, make a note here. Um, this uh, can also apply to pr to products that are uh, reprocessed. Um, and finally, uh, as I said before, at the end of the transition period, the responsibility for creating um, the list of high risk FNAOs will uh, fall to the to the UK and to the Food Standards Agency. 
Uh, this list will um, will probably be reviewed biannually based on emerging evidence and commodities will be added or removed uh, removed from the list and the frequency of controls uh, can be changed. So it is always important to uh, when uh, exporting uh, high risk FNAOs to the UK to please check the list that you can see in this slide with the um, with the details of all the high risk uh, FNAO products. Thank you so much. Thank you both very much. Um, I think now we have some time for some questions. I know that my, our colleagues from DEFRA have been busy answering them in the Q&A, but um, I think uh, if we have time, um, Duncan, if you've uh, cleared your cough, we could cover a couple of them perhaps. <laughs> Well, I'll do my best. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, the first one we had was um, uh, about uh, it came in. This question came in when we were talking about the GVMS system. So the, the question was about whether traces was similar to that system. But I think um, Anastasia has confirmed in the uh, Q and A that, of course, traces will be replaced by iPaths in That's uh, right, Great yeah. Britain. Yeah. But can you just confirm that there will be a need for uh, UK exporters to enter details or provide details for traces in the EU. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, um, they're, 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 they, just, um, they have they have to do both sides. If they give it as an equation, they have to do one on on the UK side and one on the on the EU side, and there is no connection between the two. Lovely. So so they have to fill out the, uh, the the you have to go through the process on either side of the channel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we did have a question about um, pharmaceuticals being uh, introduced. We'll have the special procedures will be there, but my colleagues will post some links to that detail because I don't think that's quite in your area. Is that correct? It really isn't. No. <laughs> OK, so bear with us. We'll, we'll post some links to that for you. Um, but some that will be in your area, I think, uh, Duncan, is about um, catch certificates and whether from the 1st of January a catch certificate will be needed to import wild caught fish to the UK and if so where can we find a template for such a catch certificate? Um, I, sadly that is not my area but we we do have our experts coming along to the Q&A later who would be able to oh, cover sorry. that. Okay Grant they're not here now right well we'll hold that thought then and we will have an answer so I take it the same um, I can see that Anastasia has replied about the live king crabs um, that they will import they will follow import rules for procedures of animal origin. Yeah um that's correct yeah uh, they follow the uh, seafood follows the same process as products of animal origin lovely thank you um so we have a question about uh reach about exporting dangerous goods um uh there's an epoxy system which is under reach regulations uh do does this uh, uh questioner or their customers in gb need to make this uk reach registration do they need to register for uk reach my export. instinct is absolutely yes, uh, mm -hmm. I, and I'm not an expert. We will check that and revert, but my understanding of the process is yes, they would. Lovely, thank you. And do, do we have um, a nice link that we can post for more information about timber related products and the necessary certificates? Again, I'm sure we could do that for you. Lovely, thank you. Um, I think um, Anastasia has clarified that um, all pallets must meet the ISPM 15 international standards. That's correct. Um, yeah. yeah, so you pal pallets, right? And I think um, a lot of the other questions that are being asked. So for those of you who are keeping an eye on the Q&A, do scroll up and down, as I said, because questions will be being asked. Um, da, da, da. I think um, we've posted a link about uh, certificates for animal products and the detail required there. I don't think the links to the tariffs explain that um, so much, but there are separate links, aren't there? there um, are. All over gov.uk for the different types of products. Just scrolling up and down now. I think that's it for the moment. Thank you very much, Duncan and Jab, but do stay with us for the plenary session. Uh, yes, I will do that. And I think, um, lovely. And Natasha, I think now we're moving on to our next colleagues um, for a, uh, to Asad Salemi from the Department of Transport for an update on how we'll be managing traffic in the UK. Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning. Can you guys all hear me? Yes. Brilliant. Uh, first slide, please. Mm -hmm. 
In February 2020, the UK and the EU published their negotiating mandate for UK-EU free trade agreement uh, negotiations. The UK document sets out our ambition to ensure UK and EU road transport operators can continue to provide services to, from and through each other's territories with no quantitative restrictions. Both the UK and EU agree on the importance of securing unlimited permit-free rights to access each other's territories. In addition to point-to-point -point or bilateral transport and transit, uh, we are open to a discussion of additional rights that would offer economic and environmental benefits. This could include cabotage and cross-trade, which offers a commercial and economic benefit to UK hauliers, but also significantly to EU hauliers, who undertake six times more cabotage in the UK than UK hauliers do in the EU. The government will communicate arrangements informing EU operators on how to operate for the end of the transition period in good time. This will cover changes to documentation requirements of types of journeys that can be carried out in in the in the UK. So obviously uh, this is all currently being negotiated. So there's there's a Commons campaign and we're working very closely with trade associations and through these types of forums to explain those changes when we have clarity and the outcome of negotiations, negotiations is clear. Uh, second slide, please. The UK government is developing a new web service known as Check and HGV is ready to cross the border for roll on roll off freight industry. This service will be introduced for railroad freight leaving GB for the EU and will help ensure that our new vehicles carrying the correct customs and import export documentation for the EU's import controls travel to the ports. The UK government intends to make the use of the web service a legal requirement for HGVs over 7.5 tonnes that are intended to travel outbound from GB via the port of Dover or Eurotunnel. This means that the service will issue a Kent access permit digitally for every HGV for which the required information has been successfully provided. There's a link there in the slides to a demo site. Um, uh, which is to let the freight industry users see how the service will look and what questions it will ask and what information it will provide. Um, next slide, please. In 2019, the government, with the help of the Kent Resilience Forum, developed and implemented Operation Brock to manage HTV traffic and deal with any potential disruptions at the short straits. Uh, this was supported by a number of statutory instruments as the risk of disruption may occur again at the end of the 2020 EU transition period, HMG are proposing the following changes. Uh, so extending the legislation to the end of October 2021, making the use of the check and HGV service mandatory uh, for all HGV traveling into Kent, prioritizing live and fresh seafood and day old chicks through the Operation Brock queues if there are significant delays, updating road layouts to reflect potential changes to the Operation Brock plans, and further to this, we are continuing to work with Kent Resilience Forum to update traffic management plans in Kent at the end of the transition period. So haulers who reach Kent without the correct border paperwork or who try to circumvent Operation Brook would face on the spot fines of £300. I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Um, let's have a look and see if there's uh, questions. Thank you, Asad. Um, I think we've posted a link, haven't we, to the, have we posted a link to the demo of the H Checker HGV in the q and I think that's a useful uh, place to go. And um, we uh, have already posted a link to the Hollywood Handbook, I think, okay. and that is now, as I said, translated into um, other languages. But mm -hmm. I think um, for the moment, I think that's it for questions, Asad, but if we can uh, ask you to stay with us in case others come through the event, that would be lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I'm delighted to hand over to colleagues from uh, the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, and Abigail Gamble is going to talk us through placing goods on the UK market. Thank you very Thank much. You. And yeah, just to recap, my name's Abigail Gamble and I work in the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy um, and particularly in trade. So today we're going to give you a bit of an overview of the general regulatory issues that manufacturing businesses will need to consider when they plan to place goods on the market in Great Britain from the 1st of January 2021. Please can we go on to the next slide. Thank you. So this guidance does not apply to placing goods on the market in Northern Ireland 
or to goods moving between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. You can find further guidance to this on gov.uk and at any point um, I can post some links to that guidance if helpful. As a manufacturer, the first thing that you need to do is to check what, which regulations actually apply to your products and some of these are outlined um, on the slides being shown now. This presentation today is going to cover what's commonly known as new approach goods. So these can be commonly identified by the CE marking. This will cover a variety of goods from things such as children's toys, machinery um, to PPE. Other goods covered include old approach legislation or non-harmonised goods. These aren't going to be covered in any detail today, but more details can be found on gov.uk for these sectors. And again, um, I can provide some links if helpful. Could you go on to the next slide, please? If you've already placed C mark goods on the EU or UK market before the 1st of January next year, you do not need to do anything. Those goods can continue to circulate freely on the market until they reach their end user. The new UKCA mark will be introduced from the 1st of January 2021, so the beginning of next year, to replace the CE marking in Great Britain. For now, and from the 1st of January, the essential requirements and standards for the UKCA marking will be exactly the same as they are now for the CE marking. We recommend that businesses start to take steps to prepare for the upcoming changes to the domestic regime as soon as possible, and that includes in terms of marking. However, to allow businesses time to adjust, CE mark goods can continue to be placed on the Great British market until the 1st of January 2022. So that's for an additional year in most cases. In some cases, this is actually longer. So an example of that is for medical devices, where there is a longer period of time where CE mark medical devices will be accepted on the Great British market. This is the case if you are self-certifying or using an EU notified body. So the key point there is that if you are using an EU notified body um, to gain the CE marking, that will be accepted on the Great British market until the 1st of January 2022. More details of any exemptions to this can be found on gov.uk. From January 2022, you will need to start using the UKCA marking in most cases for goods that are destined for the Great British market. However, there is another transitional arrangement here, and that is that until the 1st of January 2023, for most new approach goods, you have the option to affix the UKCA marking on a label affixed to the product or an accompanying document. Could we move on to the next slide, please? If you're using a UK body from the 1st of January 2022, sorry, if you're using a UK body from the 1st of January 2021, so that's from the beginning of next year, if you um, are using a UK based notified body for mandatory third party conformity assessment, then that because they are only able to certify for the UKCA marking, you will have to use the UKCA mark. However, if you currently self certify for the CE mark, then you can continue to do so for the UKCA mark or for the CE marking. And if you're using an EU body, you can continue to use the CE marking until the 1st of January 2022. When using the UKCA mark, you will also need to draw up a UK Declaration of Conformity. The information that needs to be included on the UK Declaration of Conformity will be the same as what you are currently doing and which is required for the EU Declaration of Conformity, except this document should refer to UK legislation rather than the EU legislation. The details of these legislation changes can also be found on gov.uk. It's also important to note that you can place both the UKCA and the CE marking onto the same product if it is destined for both the GB and EU markets, so long as the product meets the relevant regulatory requirements for both markets and neither marking impedes the visibility of the other. Please could we move on to the next slide? I'm now going to cover a little bit about what you need to do if your product requires mandatory third party conformity assessment. So the big change here is that UK based notified bodies will become UK approved bodies from the beginning of next year. So from the 1st of January 2021. The UK have recently published UK MCAP, which is a database that is similar to the EU's NANDO database, but lists UK recognised bodies. 
This will contain all details of UK approved bodies. So if you're interested in finding a body for the UK market, you can um, search that now. If your products require mandatory third party conformity assessment, currently this will need to be done by a UK recognised body from the 1st of January 2022 in most cases. As I mentioned previously, there are some exceptions to this rule where the CE marking will be valid for a longer period of time. So it is really important to check sector specific guidance. What's also important to note is that often these things can have lead in times. So it's really important to start planning ahead of this. Start contacting UK based bodies where this is required ahead of the 1st of January 2022 to ensure you've got um, precautions in place ready for that date. I'm also just going to briefly mention about placing goods on the EU market. And just to note, from the beginning of next year, conformity assessments carried out by UK bodies will not be recognised in the EU and you will need separate UK and EU certificates if that's the case. Voluntary testing and self-declaration of conformity will not be impacted for either market. So you can continue to use um, the other parties' bodies for voluntary testing and you can continue to self-declare for both markets. Please could we move on to the next slide? This slide um, just briefly reiterates some key points. Um, this is to ensure that your product is market compliant. You should contact your notified body as soon as possible to understand your options for conformity assessment and your certificates. You will also need separate certificates for the UK and EU markets well in advance of the 1st of January 2022. As I mentioned previously, there's often um, a level of reassessment that may be required, so it's really important to start planning for this as soon as possible. Please, could you have the next slide? It's important to be aware of how um, these, this impacts your legal responsibilities. So some EU distributors of GB goods and some great British distributors of EU goods will become importers from the 1st of January. You will become an importer if you are the first one bringing goods from outside the UK and placing them on in the market in Great Britain. If someone has already placed a good on the UK market before they sell it in Great Britain, you will actually remain a distributor and you will not have any additional responsibilities. However, if you do become an importer, you will gain extra responsibilities. This will include indicating your name and address on the product packaging or accompanying document. But there are other responsibilities, so it's really important to check on gov.uk exactly what those responsibilities are. For 24 months from the 1st of January 2021, so that's until the 1st of January 2023. For the Great British market, the additional importer address can go on an accompanying document rather than the product itself. That accompanying document must accompany the product um, until it reaches its end user. From the 1st of January 2021, all authorised representatives for the Great British market must be based in Great Britain or Northern Ireland. Generally, authorised representatives are optional. UK based authorised representatives will also no longer be recognised within the EU. Please can we move on to the next slide? This slide covers old approach requirements. So there is some detail that you'll be able to look at um, when the slides are circulated. Some of this information has been covered by some colleagues earlier in the presentation, but we will not have time to go into much detail for these today. But as mentioned um, throughout, there is lots more information on gov.uk and lots of guidance covering all of these sectors. My suggestion would be to search man placing manufactured goods on the GB market from the 1st of January 2021, which is the main landing page for this area um, of information. And then you can find links to all of these sector specific information as well. And then just onto the final slide. So this just run throughs um, is like a bit of a tick list of things that you should be doing um, in advance of the 1st of January. So it's really important just to check which regulations do apply to your product and does the information that I've said today apply to your product? And that will be the case if it's a new approach good. So commonly identified by the CE marking. You will, if you need a new product approval, you should begin this as soon as possible to make sure this is ready well in advance. Um, of the date that it comes into force. 
you may need to appoint a new authorised representative to act on your behalf. It's also important to check that your supply chain and distributors understand any new legal duties that they've, they will acquire. And it's also finally very important to check which marking and labelling ch changes apply to your product and make sure again that um, that's all taken into account well in advance um, of the 1st of January 2022. Thank you. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to take those. Abigail, thank you very much. I'm keeping an eye on the Q&A, but I think your slides are so clear. There are no questions yet. <laughs> thank you for that. But um, if anybody in the any of the attendees have a question for Abigail, I think, can you stay with us for a little bit longer? Perhaps yeah, we can. Thank you very much. That's lovely. Um, um, on that basis, then, I think uh, we're next moving on to cover the subject of data adequacy and uh, Nigel Hickson from the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport has joined us, I think, Nigel, by phone. Is that correct? <coughs> yes. And <coughs> sorry. Good. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Thank you. Loud and clear. I'm 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 so I'm so pleased. Yes, I I have a phone and a screen. It's all uh, technology is, uh, is 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 too complicated. Well, it's delightful to to be able to uh, uh, speak to people in, uh, in in in, uh, in in the Nordic states and and, and elsewhere. Uh, it's a real real pleasure, and it's just a shame that we can't do it face to face. I I find it much easier face to face. So <coughs> uh, I'm going to be fairly. Uh, Fairly brief this morning because I think this may be an area that you're you're you're, you're fairly uh, 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 you have an understanding of. Uh, essentially, I work in the uh, department for uh, digital culture, media, and sport (UCMS), and uh, we have a responsibility, along with the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK, for uh, data protection issues. And uh, in 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 particular, uh, I work in a team that's working with uh, businesses and the third sector and the public sector on data preparation and uh, data adequacy issues ahead of the end of the uh, transition period uh, at the end of December. Uh, as, as some of you will uh, will know, and I'm now on the first slide, I'm sorry, I can't see the slide, but uh, so I'm on the first slide if that's, uh, if, if that's up. So, as many of you will know, the uh, the UK, like uh, other European countries that you're in, uh, was a signatory to the General Data Protection uh, Regulation, uh, which uh, came into force in, uh, in May 2018. And uh, and during this transition year, the GDPR has also applied to the UK. So data flows uh, from the UK to the European Union and the other way around have continued and will continue. Uh, uh, under normal arrangements until the 31st of uh, December. Uh, from the 31st of December, we become a third country in terms of data protection uh, issues, and uh, the UK uh, have applied to the European Commission for a finding of data adequacy. Uh, I think many of you will probably know what data adequacy uh, data adequacy is. I mean, essentially, uh, data adequacy is a uh, is a, a finding or is a gift, if you like, from the European Commission. The European Commission can designate uh, a third country to be adequate in terms of their data protection laws and their data protection uh, uh, sort of requirements, etc., or business. And if there if, if that country is determined to be adequate, uh, then uh, it goes on to a list and there's a number of adequate countries, including uh, New Zealand and Jersey and Guernsey and Japan. And uh, essentially then data flows much like it would flow between uh, uh, European Union uh, countries uh, at the moment. Uh, on, the, on the first slide, of course, we note the importance of, of these data flows. These data flows uh, underpin, as it says, every aspect of modern life, not just uh, through not just governments and organisations, but citizens as, as, as well in, in, in many different walks of life, uh, data is transferred between entities, whether it's to do with customs, whether it's to do with teacher qualifications, whether it's to do with social media, whether it's to do with regulation, trade, et cetera, et cetera. If you could just go on to the next 
uh, slide, uh, I, I think the second slide, data adequacy, the process. I, I, I think uh, the process is not that important, but essentially the European Commission assessed the UK's data protection frameworks to assure that we are we are essentially equivalent to EU standards. Now, I mean, that, that should be trivial in the sense that, of course, the UK up until the 31st of December applies the GDPR. The GDPR is, is, is enshrined in, in UK legislation and therefore our data protection regime is identical to the data protection regime in Latvia, in Estonia, in Lithuania or, or, or wherever. Uh, but uh, the European Commission looked beyond the data protection uh, regime and they also look at other laws that could affect how data is transferred to other countries or how data handled within that country and that their, that's their remit and that that's all well and fine. So the progress in the talk, if we could go on to uh, uh, the fourth slide. So uh, I mean this 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 obviously is, is, is was, was written a, a couple of months ago. I mean the talks with the European Commission have taken place. Uh, the UK has uh, answered a lot of questions from the European Commission and we are now hoping that the European Commission in the next few days hopefully will, if you like, uh, send us, send the UK, uh, draft uh, adequacy decisions. So this would be a, a decision that the UK has been deemed to be adequate. The, the decision would probably be drafted that it might have some conditions attached to it which the UK would have to agree to before the Commission published the, the, the draft decisions. There's two, there's one for the General Data Protection Regulation and one for the Law Enforcement uh, Directive. Uh, and then once those decisions are adopted by the uh, European Commission, uh, they're subject to an opinion from the European Parliament, from the European Data Protection Board, uh, which is the, uh, which is the, the, the board that uh, uh, has as membership the 27 uh, uh, data protection authorities across the European Union, and, and finally the European Council sign off the uh, sign off the decision. Uh, if I was speaking to you in in September or October, I would have probably said, and we we anticipate that that would all take place before the end of the year. Realistically, that probably will not uh, take place now before the end of the year, and uh, we anticipate that uh, even if the uh, even if the European Commission were to uh, adopt uh, the draft decisions today or, or publish the decisions, then uh, it, 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 there could be a gap between the 1st of January and uh, when, uh, when all the different approvals have been given, as I outlined earlier. So, so essentially, uh, what we've been doing in, in, in the UK and we come on to the last slide, if you like, which is the, probably the most important in this, in, 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 in for this audience, in that we are preparing for a no adequacy scenario. Uh, we have not yet received the decisions from the European Commission. We hope they will be positive, but of course they might not be, and therefore we have to prepare uh, uh, that we might not have a, an adequacy scenario in, in place at the end of the transition period or that there might not be other arrangements to manage any, any gap that, uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that will probably be uh, in place. Uh, preparedness involves uh, ensuring that uh, UK entities, whether they be in the public, the private or the third sector, talk to their uh, European counterparts about the transfer of data from the European Economic Area to the UK and talk about alternative transfer mechanisms that would need to be put in place to ensure the uh, continued flow of that data. Uh, the flow of the data from the UK to the European uh, Union uh, is, is, is not affected uh, at the end of the transition period, as, 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 as you might uh, uh, understand. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's only the flow of the data uh, from the European Economic Area to the, uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the UK. So that's, that's, the, that's, the situation that we're, that's the situation that we're in at the moment. We are working, as I said, with the public sector and with the businesses to ensure that uh, they are prepared uh, for a no adequacy scenario, working with their European counterparts to put uh, standard contractual clauses in place or to put in place other 
transfer mechanisms to allow the continued free flow of, of that data. So I think I, 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 would, I would stop there. Uh, I mean, the, the relevance to this audience is, is clearly that hopefully if, you're, if you are involved in trade with the UK or you are involved in uh, social interactions with the UK or with the public sector in the UK and you do transfer uh, personal data between uh, your country and, and the European, uh, sorry, and the UK, that uh, that you've already been in touch with your UK counterpart and uh, you are, are making suitable arrangements for the continued flow of, of that data. So, I mean, thank you very much for this opportunity and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll stop there. I realise there's lots of other uh, issues that you need to cover, but obviously always delight, always happy to answer questions either now or uh, another time. Nigel, thank you very much. Um, I'm just keeping a close eye on the Q&A. No questions in yet. Um, again, uh, so, such a clear, clear presentation perhaps means that there are none or people are mulling them over. So um, we will share them with you as and when they come in. So thank you. Oh, sorry. One, more, one question before you before you escape. Um, there is a question on um, whether you have any comments on the situation with EEA EFTA countries on the data adequacy. Uh, agreements there is that something you'd like to take away? Well, I, I mean, I think that you know it, it, it's a similar situation to, to to an extent in terms of the transfer from uh, EFTA countries to the uh, uh, to the UK. As I understand, the uh, if, if the European Commission publishes a decision, then <coughs> that 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 decision can also cover their own their their own arrangements. So if there's a finding of adequacy. And as I understand it, then uh, then that would also be applicable uh, to transfers as well. Lovely, thank you. And um, another question in um, this, this question uh, is about uh, if the client is uh, a limited company, but this questioner works with the head office for the purposes of data transfer, for instance, payrolls, for example, do they need an agreement um, SCC with the parent company? Yeah, perhaps I didn't mm. fully, fully. Uh, sorry, perhaps I didn't fully understand the question. I mean, the, the, the I mean, in, in, in terms of agreements, if, if you're transferring data from the European Economic Area, so, 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 for example, if you're a, uh, if you've got relationships with a UK company and uh, you've got some people on the payroll in, 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 in your country. In wherever, and you're transferring it to the UK, and that that data is of your employees, and perhaps you're transferring it to the UK, so payment can be made from the UK or, or whatever. Then that is a transfer of data, yes. And if the head office is in the UK, then that is a restricted transfer and has to be uh, covered in, in in some way. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. Um, and there's a question about uh, whether there is guidance published on the alternative arrangements. Yes, so uh, I, I'm not sure what I can put in the chat, but I'll I'll, I'll try and uh, I'll, uh, I'll try and put something in the chat. I think I, I can put things in the chat, and I'll put these. You should be able to. Thank you. Yes. We'll, we'll make sure it's published. The, Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Nigel. I think that seems to be it for now, um, but uh, we will share any questions with you and by all means send us the link and we'll make sure that it's published to the guidance for the alternative arrangements. Thank you. And um, I think now we're ready to talk about the um, mobility and people, that is the entry of uh, temporary stay of people. And, and again, we're joined by colleagues from the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, and I think we have Katrina Riley and Zoe Pruce with us this morning. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm just checking you can hear me. Yes, thank you. Perfect. Yes, I can hear you. Great. Um, good morning. Um, so yeah, I work in the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy um, in the services team. I'm here today with my colleague Katrina um, and today we'll be talking through mobility of people. So in free trade agreements, this is termed mode four, um, the entry and temporary stay of people for business purposes. So if I can ask you to move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so mode four is inherently temporary 
although uh, the duration of stay for the types of service supply under this mode of trade can range um, from three months to three years. So under mode four, there are usually five categories of service supplier. We have short term and short notice visits. Um, so under short term business visitors, where this is usually for um, less than 90 days in a 180 day period. Um, we have transfers to a subsidiary or a branch of the same company in a different country. Um, we have people carrying out contracts to supply a service to a client in another country where one company is contracted to do work for another and a similar thing, but for self-employed people. So these are independent professionals. And then we also have people who move temporarily to invest on behalf of a company. So in this kind of collection, you can see the short term of 90 days and 180 compared to um, intra-corporate transfers, which can be anything up to um, three years. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so it's important first to note that travel for work and business purposes between the UK and the EU will change for UK and EU nationals on the 1st of January 2021. Um, in terms of travelling to the UK, the main point is that business travellers from EU, EEA and Switzerland uh, may need to apply for a visa before travelling to the UK from the 1st of January 2021. Um, while any provisions under a UK and EU free trade agreement are still subject to negotiation. EU nationals under UK domestic rules will be able to travel to the UK for short stays of up to six months without a visa when undertaking specific activities. Um, a specific list of visa free permitted activities for short stays can be found on gov.uk. Uh, I think these slides are being shared, so you'll have that link in there, but otherwise I'm sure you can share it in another way. Um, so this list includes business meetings, attending conferences, but also some after sales, uh, cultural, legal, entertainment services activities. There's a there's a full exhaustive list online. Um, for stays longer than six months or if undertaking any other activities that are not included in that list just mentioned, a visa may be required. Um, EU, EEA and Swiss nationals can apply for this through the UK's new points based system. Again, um, there's a link provided in that slide um, which provides more information on the points based system. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this is um, business travel to the EU, EEA and Switzerland. In terms of audience, I'm not sure if this is um, greatly relevant, but um, this is a similar thing. So um, business travellers from the UK may need to apply for a visa or work permit or other documentation from 1st of January. And we are um, advising UK nationals to check the rules of the relevant member state um, to find out if they need to apply for a visa and or work permit. Um, so if we can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So, um, yeah, what does this mean for businesses? What are the practical steps you may need to take? Um, we advise checking if you need a visa or other documentation to travel for business purposes, um, applying for that visa ahead of time before you travel, and also checking that your passport is valid for at least six months before you travel. Again, there's um, uh, an option to, to search for visa immigration rules on gov.uk, which um, should hopefully provide all their information that's um, required. Um, I think that's the end of our presentation, super speedy, um, but uh, yeah, we're here for any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I just have a quick look at the Q&A. Um, I think the, there's a question in about lorry drivers from third countries employed in the EU companies. Um, are there any particular requirements that they need to be aware of? that you can point them to a guidance perhaps. In terms of lorry drivers, I think um, that's actually 
not totally under our remit, but um, mm -hmm. unless my colleague Katrina can help out here, um, I can take that question away and um, provide an answer to you to pass on if that's OK. Hi, yeah, nothing to add from me. It's uh, something that our, our colleagues in goods deal with. Um, but just to note that for um, hauliers and, and lorry drivers that, uh, you know, the passport situation is going to also be the same. So to make sure to check that that's validated um, mm. at least when traveling to the UK. Thanks. Lovely. Thank you very much both. Thank you. Um, and we'll keep an eye on the questions as the uh, as the event goes on. So thank you. Um, I think that concludes our presentations from our colleagues across government departments now. Um, and if we can move on to the next slide. Um, uh, I'm going to talk you through some case studies. So what we've tried to do is bring together uh, a lot of the detail that we talked about this morning to help you understand how things will actually move and work. Um, there are further events planned for next week that I'll talk to you a little bit about next week that give you more detail and more will give more detail on case studies. But um, if we could first of all uh, just we'll, we'll do these two case studies we planned for you this morning. We're going to move goods through the short straits, as we call it, that is from Calais or Coquel into and out of Dover and Folkestone through the Eurotunnel or on the ferries. So we, we thought we'd focus on the four short straits routes today. Um, and as I said, there'll be uh, further case studies published uh, in due course. And also we will be doing more at events next week that I'll tell you about a little bit later. But um, we hope this will help you to start thinking about and putting into practice a lot of the detail that we've covered this morning. And the first case study uh, is an example of exporting standard goods. We've chosen auto parts from the EU to Great Britain through the short straits um, into the EU. Now we've chosen an example of moving goods from France into um, Great Britain. Uh, purely because it was so hard to pick one of the many countries that we had this morning. We didn't want to favour any one over the others, but we'll talk you through the principles of how it would work if it was coming from uh, another EU country. So in this particular example, as I said, we're moving these standard goods from January 2021. We're not going to use transit for this particular case study, just a straightforward export and import into Great Britain. Um, all of the players are listed down in the bottom left of the slide. Um, we have an EU exporter, um, the French administration in this particular case, we have an e a UK importer, we have a driver um, and the various administrations, of course, and uh, last but by no means least, the carrier that will bring the goods across the, um, the uh, channel. So in this case, Felix is a, an EU exporter. Um, he has prepared. He's got his EU EORI number. He's agreed the INCO terms and conditions for the sale with Emma, that is the uh, UK importer. So everybody is very clear about the responsibilities um, at the border and the border formalities. Felix pre lodges his export declaration, and because he's in France, he's going to use the Delta G system, uh, which is their customs declaration system, and that will produce an export accompanying document the EAD. This is also a merged export um, uh, safety and security declaration, the EXS, so they're merged into the one, um, one declaration. And that is entered into, automatically entered through into the export control system, which is EU wide. So if the movement was starting in another member state, for instance, um, you could uh, raise the export declaration there. The EAD would be produced there um, and it would be fed into the export control system. So the other member state would be the Office of um, Export and France, because you're leaving through France, would be the Office of Exit in this case. And you would note that when entering the export declaration and that, as I said, all feeds into the export control system in the EU. Um, if the movement did start in another member state, but uh, Felix wanted to use uh, do the export from France, he would need to get representation in France. He wouldn't be able to just turn up and do his export declaration in France. He would need to have an agent there um, who is registered and use a fiscal representative. So the export declaration is done. The export accompanying document is produced. Um, a movement reference number is then generated by the custom system. In this example, the French custom system Delta G from the EAD. 
Emma, meanwhile, has arranged collection of the goods from Felix with her haulage firm. And Joe is the driver. So Felix, uh, Joe arrives at Felix's uh, premises and uh, Felix provides Joe with the EAD, the export accompanying document and the movement reference number is on there. So if Joe carries several consignments, um, he will combine them into a single movement reference number using the French SI Brexit system. You may have read about this. There's a lot of detail available online about it. Um, it's not dissimilar to the GVMS system that um, uh, Flavia outlined, but they, the two are not connected. This is a separate French system that um, combines the movement reference numbers um, uh, involved in the truck or the HGV into one envelope, as they call it, the logistics envelope. So they would need to do that if they had a number of consignments in the in the truck. Uh, Emma, the importer, has prepared as well, and she has her GBE ORI number. She is going to take advantage of the staged controls that um, the government has outlined, and she's going to defer her declaration for six months after the import to Great Britain. So all Joe needs to have in that case is a copy of her EORI number. So that means that if he's stopped by border force or any other controls at the ports, he can show this EORI number to show that the declaration is being handled by Emma. Joe um, leaves uh, Felix's premises and travels to the um, to the uh, point of departure in the EU. In this case, he's going to use the Eurotal out of uh, EU and uh, he arrives at the Coquel terminal. As I said, at point number eight, we uh, can be clear that Joe just has the importer's EORI number if he needs to provide that evidence, if he's pulled for any risk-based checks on the route. Um, so uh, at the port, the uh, movement reference number is scanned at the Eurotunnel pit stop. Uh, Eurotunnel and the ports, um, the ferry operators will scan the movement reference number in for this for these movements. There's a lot of detail on their websites about how they're going to operate this. But in the Eurotunnel example, account holders can also use the Eurotunnel border pass service to submit or preload their data in advance. And this reduces the number of questions they may be asked and have to answer at the pit stop. So when the truck then gets onto the, the train shuttle, or if it was leaving by Calais through a ferry, um, when the point of no return is reached, the EAD is discharged by Eurotunnel's IT systems and the ferry systems will communicate with the French SI Brexit system to say the goods have left. And that will feed on through into the export control system and indeed back into other member states as needed. So um, all are clear that the goods have now left the EU. In this particular example, Joe and the truck make the crossing from Coquel to Foxton. And of course, you can um, you will recall from Flavia's presentation that no entry summary declaration or import safety and security declaration is required by Joe because the import is before the 1st of July 2021. There's a six months waiver for those. Joe arrives at the Folkestone terminal. Uh, he leaves the train and drives straight onto the M20 and towards the delivery address. So nice straightforward example is nobody stopped for checks and on they go. Um, Emma has her Iori number and we, as we've said, she's given this to Joe, so he has that. Um, she has checked the tariff rates and once her goods arrive, she makes the entry into her own records, her entry and declaration records. There is a full list in the border operating model of the information she needs to put in there, but it includes detail about the date and the time and entry of goods and the type of goods and um, number of goods. In this example, Emma is VAT registered, of course, and so she can use postponed VAT accounting to account for any import VAT. This is paid quarterly and that can't be delayed for six months. But within six months of the date of import, in this example, Emma needs to have applied for and be authorised to use the simplified procedures. And she will need to make her supplementary declaration within six months. So she'll need to make that before July 2021. And it's six months from the date of import, as Flavia outlined. Um, Emma has registered for a duty deferment account and she, that is debited when she submits her supplementary declaration. So all done, export completed um, in the EU, uh, formalities completed at the border, um, export discharged and import done. That's a, a fairly straightforward movement through the short straits of standard goods from January.
Of course, in July, if they're moving, they're doing the same movement in July, Joe would also be interacting with the uh, Goods Vehicle Movement Service um, for the GB import. He would be noting that. Um, and also, of course, a safety and security declaration would be required. But those are the main changes, really, that uh, businesses will need to prepare for between January and July. Thank you. Right, pause, and we can move on to the second um, case study. This is a busier case study, a little bit more complex. Um, I wanted to give you an example of a transit movement and also to reflect the sort of procedures that we will have to have for um, other goods such as lamb and meat. Um, in this particular case study, again, we're moving the goods in January. We're going to export some lamb as meat from Great Britain to the EU um, through this time. We're going to use a ferry. And again, we're leaving from the port of Dover. So we're going through the Channel Tunnel through the short straits. In this example, we have Luke. He sells lamb for export to the EU. He has prepared. He's got a GB Yori number and his premises is listed as an authorised establishment in the UK um, and by the EU competent authorities. So the meat has a GB health identification mark. Uh, Luke has spoken with his logistics provider, who is Bill, and he's discussed with Bill about the entry port. So he's been clear with Bill that, of course, he needs to carry the goods through um, a port in the EU that will have the right border control post, the CIVEP, that handles those goods. And of course, he's going to move through the port of Calais, so the CIVEP is in place um, and he has arranged with the CIVEP for the goods to arrive. The, um, it will be open 24-7 for products of animal origin, we understand, in Calais. Luke has applied via the new EHC online system for an export health certificate, his EHC, and he's downloaded the form from Traces to send to the um, AFA and the consignments are made available for inspection. You'll recall that Duncan talked us through the need to have the access to the Traces for this. Um, the UK International Trade Centre uh, will check the application online with the destination export requirements and the uh, competent authority will dispatch the export health certificate on the ecosystem and the certifier receives a notification on their dashboard. So they'll be notified that the meat passes inspection by the competent authority and is stamped to generate the EHC, which is signed by the competent authority. It's quite a lot of detail there. We've published, uh, we've sent a link to the guidance about the procedures for um, moving animal products, but uh, we hope this helps to bring it a little bit to life for you. Luke then receives the original export health certificate from the UK competent authority. He needs to now send a copy of this to Alex. Alex is the EU importer and he gives the original certificate to Bill. Bill is the driver who carries the goods and Bill needs to have a copy of the original certificate as he moves the goods. So we've got the export health certificate um, provided to Bill, the hard copy, and Alex has a copy of it also to, um, to put into the EU traces system. And if you move across to the right here, you've got point 4B. Alex will need to submit this common health entry document and pre-notification at least one working day of advance and arrival of the meat. And he submits that to traces um, and having scanned the having received the scanned export health certificate from Luke, he uploads the copy of that into the traces system. So moving back over now to number five, 5A, Luke appoints Bill's firm, um, he appoints them to move the goods uh, using transit, common transit convention. Bill is an authorised consignor and has a transit guarantee in place and he is also providing the transport. He pre-lodges a combined export and safety and security declaration that is uh, abbreviated to an EXS into the UK customs system known as CHIEF and that generates uh, an export accompanying document as in the previous example we have an EAD. Bill can then start the transit movement and he gets the local reference number from the NCTS, the new computerised transit system used for transit, um, and he includes this pre-notification number in box 44 of the transit accompanying document, the TAD. So NCTS, the system will validate and set the TAD and the transit movement can start, and this is a Bill's premises because he's an authorised consignor. 
The movement reference number is produced and the paper tagged with the movement reference number on it is given to Bill. Again, he must carry this with him. The paper tagged and the MRN, again, as I said, must be given to Bill and goes with the consignment. Bill has an EU EORI number. The haulier has an EU EORI number um, and he's therefore made the entry summary declaration into the French import control system. He's used an electronic data interface um, on the ICS service within two, and he must do this within two hours of arrival of the ferry. He has now received the permission to progress, that is the departure message from the UK customs system known as Chief, and the export is discharged once he's had that. This is January. Bill is an existing ferry operator customer and he has signed the terms and conditions of carriage. Um, he has completed the checking, a HGV is ready. I think that, uh, that's the service that Assad talked us through. So he's produced, he's completed that, and he's got his Kent access permit. So he can set off now for the port of Dover. The TAD, the barcode, is scanned at the ferry check-in at Dover and he confirms that he is transporting meat. Uh, he's informed that the status of the consignment will be default orange and he may need to take the consignment to a BCP or CIVEP in the port of Calais. A uh, check in the number plate, the ANPR of Bill's truck is captured and that data then is paired with the movement reference number of his TAD. Bill boards the ferry, watches the screens in the driver lounge and the ferry departs. The ferry operator sends a message to the French SI Brexit system 10 minutes after the ferry has departed. The Delta T, that is the um, system in France which handles transit, will check if in traces if there is a valid export health certificate and it continually checks the status in traces until the arrival of the ferry. In this particular example, the consignment is selected for uh, controls and the status on the ferry lounge screen remains at orange to go to the CIVEP. He changes it from orange Douane, orange customs to orange CIVEP. So in this way, um, Bill is clear that he needs to take the, the goods to the CIVEP for checking. Um, the goods undergo a document inspection at the CIVEP and they undergo identity checks. Um, the rate, of course, of inspection is set by EU rules. Um, the CIVEP may hold the goods while the tests take place. Um, if it's not selected for further laboratory tests, um, it can be sometimes, but in this example, we've said it, it won't be. Um, and uh, the outcome of the inspection and any approvals is uh, by the competent authority is uploaded and uh, noted in traces. So in this case, in the case of the common transit declaration, once the checks have been carried out, so the checks have been done at the CIVAP and they've been carried out, Alex as the declarant has to communicate through an electronic mail to the transit office the following information. So he needs to send the PDF of the CHED issued by the Border Control Post, the CIVAP. He needs to send the reference of the transit declaration as well as the transit office confirmed. And based on those elements, then customs officers will notify the passage into Delta T. Then the Office of Transit function will be completed then when that's done, and notified of its arrival in a new customs territory, that is the customs territory of the EU. Bill can then leave the, the BCP and the CIVAP and continue to the delivery address, wherever that may be in the EU. Um, Alex, as the authorised consignee, for transit movements. Um, so he, he's applied and he's been approved as that. So when he, Bill arrives at Alex's premises, Alex can check the NCTS system and see that the Office of Transit function has been completed. Um, he then uses the NCTS system to end the transit movement. He discharges the T form by releasing the meat into free circulation using an import declaration in the EU and he pays the relevant duties and import VAT and of course the transit movement um, closed and the guarantee released. That's a, uh, a rather quick run through a uh, transit movement from GB into the EU. We hope we've picked up a lot of the principles of transit movements and given you a sense of the, the, um, the requirements at the different stages. We have been uh, using a lot of these case studies at our events across the EU um, and they, they are useful, but we are pulling more together. 
um, and we hope to publish them and make them available on gov.uk. But as I said, we will be sharing these slides with you and you will have an opportunity to uh, go through them in detail and we hope they help. Um, I'll just look at a couple of the questions that I can see that are coming through now. I think um, in the first case study, we're asked if there's a, a, an EORI number in GB if you are an exporter from the EU with a customer in the UK. So um, and unless Flavia wants to jump in and correct me, I'm happy to confirm that if you are just exporting goods from the EU, you are not interacting as an exporter, you're not interacting with any UK systems, um, you're not carrying the goods yourself, you will not need a GB EORI number. Flavia, are you still with us? Can you confirm that's correct? I'll pick that up with her later. Okay. I think uh, looking at the questions that have recently come in, I don't see any others about the case studies. On that basis, I think we'll hand over to, um, we'll go back to maybe the next round of questions and uh, plenary session. Natasha, if we could move on, thank you. Um, do we have our colleagues from HMRC and DEFRA available? It looks like HMRC may have have dropped out. I'll I'll check in on that, but I think DEFRA colleagues are definitely available. Oh, and I can see that Flavia is online again as well, so we should have everyone, Margaret. Thank you, Flavia. If you can, if we could start with you, please. We had a question on the case studies. Um, it was about the EORI number on the case study that I used. The first case study we had a, a standard export from the EU. Um, and that was uh, carried over by a transport company to the UK. And we just wanted to confirm that the EU exporter who is not interacting with UK systems will not need a UK EORI number. Is that correct? Maybe Flavia is having some technical difficulties. If we go to the DEFRA questions and I'll, I'll just yeah, check. Thank you. Thank you. Right, um, Duncan, I can see you're on with us still and perhaps your colleagues have joined us as well. We had one we wanted to pick up later, I think wasn't there, um, but we can come back to that uh, uh, if your colleagues are not with us about catch certificates. Um, do we have uh, Jack and Jason there by any chance? Apologies audience, we will. You do. <laughs> I was going to say, you do have Jason here, but I will only be able to cover the phytosanitary aspect. I'd imagine Jack might have to defer to some sort of other colleagues on the catch stuff. Um, if Jack's on that. No sound of Jack. OK, we may have to revert on that one. OK, well, we're holding this question. We're, we're, we all want to know whether we need catch certificates required for wild caught fish. Um, and uh, we will come back to that. Um, the other That's question the, that... Um, is Luke or Nick on the line? No, we're going to assume not. We'll come back to those then. We'll, um, the, there's a question we have, uh, uh, one about EORI numbers. Do, uh, Duncan, you may be able to help this, with this. Do uh, uh, businesses need an EORI number to access IPATHs? I couldn't say. I don't know definitively. I don't think one is a. I don't think it, it would it would not prevent them from accessing IPAS, but they may need the EORI once they're in. Yes. OK, right. Can we come back? We can come back and confirm that. Thank you. Um, we had a question. Um, it was a rather general question, but it might you might be able to talk us through it in the slides indeed, we'll probably have covered this, but could you just point us to the starting point for somebody who's exporting chemicals uh, to the UK? Um, OK, uh, it is in the slides. I think uh, the best thing mm -hmm. I can say about this is that um, EU and EEA based companies who import chemicals into the UK under UK reach need to ensure they're covered by a valid UK REACH registration. So that would be their starting point. These companies can register the substance under UK REACH through a UK or 
through an affiliate UK importer. If the EU or EEA company takes on the registration obligations through a UK based entity, their UK customers will retain downstream user status. So their, their, their starting point is to, to uh, register. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lovely. Um, and I think uh, the other questions, that, the main questions that we had um, are uh, from HMRC. So Natasha, if you could let me know when we've got hold of Flavia, please, that'd be really helpful. Um, thank you. And then um, I think, yes, we're still getting a lot of questions about a Yori number. So it'd be useful, I think, if we could publish some detail about the Northern Ireland Yori numbers at XI um, requirements um, and whether or not um, I think you have to have a GB or a number first before you get an XI number but it, a lot of that detail is published on gov.uk and we will share that with you and the links to that. We um, will share with the detail on Northern Ireland. I see a few questions coming in on that is published um, online and it will be updated after the news from yesterday but uh, we'll share the links with you so you can watch the updates there as um, they come through in the days and weeks to come. Um, and other DEFRA questions that we had, I think, um, I think, bear with me, uh, Duncan, were there any that you wanted to pick on particularly or expand on from the, the uh, chat that yeah, you've seen? Um, I have some from the chat, which I think I may be able to help with. Um, these are non-SPS questions. Um, so one question <laughs> was, will the UK recognise the EU organic marking Will a standard organic transaction certificate be sufficient documentation for the import of organic products into the UK? So the answer to that is the UK government proposed an organic equivalence agreement as a technical annex in its comprehensive free trade agreement proposals. Equivalence agreements for organic products such as the UK is proposed are common tools in international trades. So the negotiations are ongoing, so I can't say any more than the negotiations are ongoing there. However, to ensure the smooth transition, the UK, in respect of GB, will recognise the EU equivalent for the purpose uh, of trade in organics until the 31st of December 2021. There's another one on uh, wooden pallets. Uh, will the EPAL pallet, uh, will EPAL pallets be acceptable? Mm. Uh, and the answer there is if EPAL pallets are compliant with ISPM 15, then yes, they will be acceptable. If not, no. Um, there's another question which you brought up earlier, Margaret, about uh, dangerous goods in an epoxy system, mm. which is under the REACH regulations. Um, and the answer to that one is EU and EEA based companies who import chemicals into the UK under UK REACH must ensure that they are covered by a valid UK REACH registration. These companies can register the substance under UK REACH or through a UK based uh, or an affiliate UK importer. And the if the company takes on the registration obligations through a UK based entity, their UK cost consumers will retain that downstream user status. That's the ones that I have picked up from the chat. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, and I understand from your colleague Anastasia that we have um, someone on the line who can help us now with uh, catch certificates, um, whether they will be required for wild caught fish. Good morning. Can good you, morning, can you, Nick. Yeah, good morning. We can um, hear you loud and clear, thank you. Yeah, yeah, Luke's, Luke's trying to get in uh, at the moment, but he's, he's struggling to get, uh, to get volume. So I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do on his behalf. Um, just to Thank confirm, um, as of the 1st of January, um, and, and we're talking specifically about imports here, is that correct? Uh, yes, yes. So it's, it, um, well, I, th I believe the question was uh, whether catch certificates were required for wild caught fish being brought into the UK. Yes, that's mm -hmm. correct. Oh, Nick, we can't hear you. Oh, I, sorry, think, you I think that was the answer, wasn't it? No, that's, think, yes, yes, oh, that's sorry. correct. They will oh, be. Sorry. Yes, yes, sorry, they will be. So, I, I'm not. I'm not going to over, overstate it if I don't have to. But um, um, yes, that yeah. is correct. Fish. Um, our UU documents will be needed as of the first of January, twenty twenty-one. 
Lovely, thank you. OK, well, while we still wait for our, our colleague from HMRC to rejoin us, um, I wonder if we have our colleague from the Department of Transport on. Uh, Asad, uh, are you available? OK, well, the question that I was going to ask Asad, and I think I can probably answer it for him, and I know he'll jump in and correct me if he can, but there was a question about whether a Kent access permit is required for goods coming into Great Britain or into Kent. These, the Kent access permit um, and the Checker HGV service is only for goods travelling out of Great Britain through UK ports, so it will not be required for those trucks or others coming in from the EU into um, Great Britain. Lovely. Um, and I think um, there was a question that was a rather general one, but I think our colleagues in Bayes have picked that up um, and by all means correct me, but it was a question about whether EU manufacturers need a subsidiary in the UK to continue trading from the 1st of January. I wonder if our Bayes colleagues are online to talk a little bit about that. Can you hear us? I can, Abigail. Hello. Yes. Hi. That was around if a subsidiary was needed in the UK. That's correct. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So, no, that's not a requirement. So you can continue to trade goods um, into the UK. The important thing is really about the great British market and the change of legal responsibilities. So if you are um, exporting goods to the UK, it's important the, the person and that you're sending them to that's first making that good available on the UK market understands their new legal responsibilities as an importer. Um, so that includes various things such as marking and labelling requirements, including the importer address. But it also includes things such as making sure they have a declaration of conformity available to market surveillance authorities on request. Um, and there are various other responsibilities they need to be aware of. But to be clear, you don't need to have a subsidiary in the UK to continue trading into the UK. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and um, we have another question perhaps for your colleagues. I think, I don't know if Katrina and others are still on the line about offshore workers from the UK um, arriving in Norway and the need for travel um, I think about the need for visas. There's some follow up questions there. Are you able to expand on that for us if you're with us? Hi, Margaret. Um, yes, we are with you. Um, I'm not sure we can answer that right now, um, but we can certainly take that one away and um, get back. I think it will be a similar thing to, you know, checking with the member state that this actually refers to. Um, but yeah, we'll, we will look into it and get back on that. Sorry about that. Thank you. No, that's fine. Thank you. Um, and uh, we will, uh, for those questions that we can't answer today, we will take them away, uh, share them with the various departments and, and make sure that they are, um, uh, they're, they, they're covering them off and sending a reply back through to the uh, embassy and back out to those of you who've asked. So if you feel that there are questions that you haven't um, heard from today, please do get in touch with us. Um, we're still waiting to get hold of our friends in HMRC and I'm keeping an eye on the chat um, to make sure that they are. But while we wait for them um, to see if they can come back in, uh, let me talk you through a little bit about our events that we're planning next week. Um, we're very aware of the timing and that um, the 31st of December uh, 2020 looms and so we're doing a lot of events across the EU. We've done a lot of events in this sort of style. We've presented the facts to you from the different government departments and we've um, sort of finished them up with case studies. But next week we'd like to uh, change the format a little bit and we're going to be doing two EU wide events that very much focus on key routes into and out of Great Britain. On the first um, event, which is on the 15th of December, we're going to focus on the movements of goods um, through the short straits and on into the land bridge and movements through GB and into the Republic of Ireland. So that is a, an event, uh, something for your calendars, perhaps on the 15th of December and, and the morning, um, we'll be doing an event that really brings to life all of those movements from uh, the EU 
uh, through the short straits and on then through GB into uh, Ireland and the, the land bridge requirements there. And on the 16th, then we're going to cover the other sort of routes in and out of uh, GB. We're very conscious that most of the, the traffic, the railroad traffic moves through the, the short straits, but of course there are many other ports and systems in place. So we wanted to make sure that we're fully covering all of those as well for audiences and those moving goods through those routes. So on the 16th of December, we'll be doing an event that covers uh, those routes. Um, such as Belgium, the Netherlands and so on into Immingham and um, other ports along the uh, east coast of Great Britain. And of course, uh, the Lambridge event will cover movements from Holyhead to Dublin and so on. So um, watch this space for the links to those events. We're busy setting them up um, and my colleagues are busy preparing them. So we expect to have quite a lot of um, interest in those. They will be for EU and for UK audiences and of course others from EEAF to countries who will have supply chains may well be interested in joining those as well. Please uh, keep an eye on them and share them with those businesses that you work with and your supply chains if you can. Um, Duncan, were there other areas that ADEFRA wanted to pick up while we still wait for um, HMRC to rejoin? Hi Margaret. Uh, no, I think I think I've covered all the non-SPS ones, unless any of my SPS colleagues have managed to get themselves online yes, I now. Think, I, yes, I, I think uh, rather I don't don't want to particularly prolong anybody's uh, any of the detail, but I think we're getting through a lot of the questions. And I know my, um, there was one question that was bothering us about we pointed towards the tariff guides, and there's a, a question about eight versus ten digits, and we have some guidance for that. We're just tracking it down, and we will share it with you as soon as we get that for those of you, but I, we believe you can use the eight digit codes um, and we're just sharing that, uh, trying to track down that detail for you and point you in the uh, direction of the link. Um, the questions that we did have for HMRC, um, and we will take them away and make sure we give the, uh, an answer to them, uh, involve a lot of questions about IORI numbers still, so we want to um, we want to make sure that we get that a lot clearer for you, perhaps. But it was also about the different inco terms. So if people are delivering duty delivers paid, um, FCA, EXW, if they're delivering goods to GB under those terms, do they need GB EORI numbers? And that was something I wanted to clarify with HMRC. My understanding really is that the general principle is if in any way you or an intermediary that is acting for you is interacting with UK systems, you will need a GBE ORI number. It's straightforward to apply for one. You just need to go in, set up a government gateway account. And as I said, you don't need to be established in the UK to do that. So if you think you need one, um, I think uh, please do apply online. It shouldn't take long to do. But if you if you or an agent acting for you um, will uh, need EORIs uh, or need to interact with those systems, please do get your EORI numbers. There was a question about um, the EMCS movement um, and uh, uh, EMCS using EMCS and how it can be started. And again, we'll put some guidance if my colleagues could post some guidance about moving um, excise products into and out of GB before the webinar ends. That would be really useful if they haven't already done so. Um, but the only thing I can flag there in the absence of HMRC is that the UK will have its own EMCS system that will not be linked to the EU EMCS system. So you would need to finish a, an EU EMCS movement at the EU border and you would need to start a fresh one on the UK EMCS system for excise goods if you are moving those goods under duty suspension in the UK. And you can log into the register of the UK EMCS system and start those movements um, at the border um, and move them to uh, as you need to. Um, I, another question I had was about commodity codes. Um, and I think it's um, uh, uh, commodity codes, whether they're not changing. I understand the commodity codes are not changing um, from the 1st of January and they are available through the links that we've got on the tariffs. But um, if if that changes, I'll let you know. And I think um, just looking down the list of questions, 
There was a question about whether we couldn't do checks on the ferries um, and to help the flow. I mean, everything else that we're trying to, to do is designed to help the flow of goods at the border. Um, but the, the goods and um, the declarations and checks, and I'm sure my colleagues in HMRC and Border Force and others would uh, reinforce this, but the checks have to be made um, and the customs authorities in those countries have to be satisfied that the, the things are done before the goods get on the ferry. But we are trying to use IT systems as we've talked you through that work through and improve that flow. Um, it looks like um, Flavia is unable to join us, I think. I don't think she's going to, unless she can dial in, um, I don't think she can get back into this uh, system. But So we will continue to collate your questions um, and share them with her. Hi, hi Margaret. Um, you've got Jack Tilbury from, from DEFRA here. I, did you did you say there were some SPS questions? I can I can see a couple if you'd like me to take the ones that I can. Fire away, Jack. That'd be lovely. Thank you. Yes, please do answer those and uh, cover those off for us. Thank you. Cool. Of course. So um, I can see there's a question that asked whether um, full border controls had moved from uh, January to July. Uh, hopefully this was this was covered by the presentation. But just to reiterate that that for import controls. Uh, SBS controls. The the controls are being introduced in stages, um, and the presentation will have outlined what those stages are. So some will come into effect January, some will come into effect on the first of April, and then uh, the full controls will come into effect from the first of July. Um, the other question that I can see is whether live king crab um, can be imported as a product of animal origin um, if it if it's uh, being imported specifically for that purpose. Um, so yes, there are uh, certain um, live animals that are treated as products of animal origin when they're being imported um, and moving directly to the final consumer. Um, but if anybody does need more guidance uh, on, on when something is classified as a product of animal origin, uh, the border operating model um, does contain links to the gov.uk page which, which outlines it in more detail. Those are the only two that I can see, but if there are any others in there that I'm missing, I'm happy to take those. Uh, thank you. I, I wonder if Nick is still with us. We've had a follow up to the catch certificates question as to whether they are also needed for frozen fish. <laughs> Hi, yes, I'm still here. Um, in terms of um, in terms of freight imports, um, yes, they will be needed for frozen fish. Basically all wild fishery products. Um, all wild caught fishery products um, that are in a consignment, apart from those that are exempt species, which is listed in Annex 1 of the amended regulation, um, they will need um, a catch certificate. It, it, it's it's, it's matless of uh, the type of product with it fresh, frozen, preserved. Does that answer thank your question? You. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Lovely. Um, and I can see um, uh, we also have a question about whether the UK will accept the uh, uh, AEO uh, authorizations issued by the EU. Um, this is part of the negotiations, but uh, as it stands at the moment, without a deal um, and without a particular deal around that, um, the AEO certification in the EU would not apply in the UK and vice versa. AEO accreditation in the UK would not apply in the EU. So you would need to make new applications in those territories if you needed to. Um, there's a few more questions about transit, but I, I don't think we've managed to get Flavia back in yet. But if we do, we'll pick those up. And um, I think um, we could perhaps um, also share some links about rules of origin. I think we can start seeing some questions about that too. Um, a complex area um, and when we really do need the experts for, but uh, in the absence of those today, we'll share the links with you. Um, we have we teased you with two Slido uh, questions at the start of the event, and I think if we could move on to the next slide, I think we have our final question for you uh, is about your, uh, how you found this event. So if we could go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So final poll, um, whether this webinar has given you a better understanding of the border procedures in the UK and the action that you need to take by the end of the transition period. And um, I, I hope you'll find it useful. We'll share the slides with you um, with all who have attended um, through email and uh, I hope you've 
find the information helpful and you can pass it on to your customers. Um, Thank Mark, you. Can you hear me? I don't know if I'm too late for this. Um, hi. Uh, no, never too hi. late, never too late. We've got a few I'm minutes really sorry. left. We just have had some some bad technical um, issues with my Wi-Fi, but if there's anything I can help, <laughs> please do shout. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We had a question and I think I've covered it off, but you may want to just double check what I said. So we have uh, questions about people who have different income terms. So they're delivering duty paid, they're uh, free carriers, they're uh, is it XWorks, EXW. So do they need GB or E numbers? I, I said that in principle, if they or their agents are interacting with UK systems, they will. But uh, if you could clarify that for us, please. Yeah, in any, in any case, they would. So um, irrespective of whether they use an agent or not, um, if they're involved in any part of the supply chain as, as a trader or in they have any interaction with the movement of goods, um, they will need a GBE or a, yes. Thank you. Um, there was a question about commodity codes and whether they're changing. I said I didn't think they were. Is that correct? <laughs> I don't think they are, no. Um, but to determine the correct commodity code, they just have to go on the gov.uk um, trade tariff. So um, that's how to best determine what commodity code to use. And they're all published online. Lovely, thank you. And there's some confusion, I think, about eight versus 10 digits. And we're just trying to track down the guidance that explains that you, if you have an eight digit one, you can use that. Um, and, um, there was a question about how can EU companies get access to the UK NCTS system to submit uh, T forms? Is there a, um, a handy link we can share for, for that? Um, yeah, let me let me see if I can. Um, so for submitting transit declarations, is that what they're? Yes, asking? yes, so it, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can uh, if I can share that. But ultimately. Um, you will you will be able to use that but also um just to stress that the gvms system will also be uh facilitating transit movements so um you know they have to kind of think about what is beneficial for them to use so in any case what i'll do is i'll share the link to that so that they have access but just to kind of stress that gvms will also be available for uh, movements of transit thank you mm -hmm. thank you um and um, I think the, there was a question about, there were a number of questions about e-commerce really, and the, um, the, just some clarity around that and the need for who needs to have a GB or e number. Um, does the, uh, can it be imported with the name and address of the a consumer? Um, I wonder if it's easiest just to publish some, a link to the guidance on e-commerce, is there, is that? Um, the only guidance that I'd point to again is in the border operating model. Nothing really changes on e-commerce apart from the VAT. So um, the collection of VAT will only apply to um, any con well, consignments or parcels or um, goods that uh, oversee the value of £135. That's the largest change there. And uh, online marketplaces for involved in facilitating the sale will be responsible for collecting and accounting for the VAT. Um, so that's that's one thing to note. And for goods sent from overseas directly to UK consumers without any online marketplaces involvement, then the overseas seller will be required to register an account for the VAT to HMRC. So effectively, you have to use the address where your your business is registered. OK, thank you. Um, and I think we've we've got a couple more questions just seeking some clarification on. So if somebody by um, buys goods FCA from the UK free carrier, do they need a UK e or e number? If someone buys goods from the UK? Yes, so um, under the FCA terms, do they need uh, a Uk e or e number? Yeah, any, yeah, yeah, yeah they, they would. Mm -hmm. So in any case, um, if they're if they're buying goods, uh, even including the FC under the FCA terms, they would still need a Yuri number. Yes. OK, uh, and that's a UK Yuri number. They yeah. 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 OK. Um, and if they're moving goods EXW terms, um, they just wanted to clarify, you said that they will need a, a Yuri number in the UK for that as well. I think we've said that's correct. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thank you. OK. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think 
that is it for uh, questions. I think we, we have a few links to send you. Um, and Flavia mentioned the border operating model there. It is a very useful place to start and includes, of course, a lot of links to the gov.uk guidance, which is updated regularly um, and as and when it needs to be with announcements. So it's useful to have that to hand. Um, I think uh, in view of the timing, that's uh, all of the questions I think we can cover today. We um, may know uh, this evening or tomorrow um, where we are on a deal, but everything that we've covered with you today um, pretty much needs to uh, be considered whether we have a deal or not. We need to be doing customs declarations and safety and security declarations and um, all of the other certifications and so on that were mentioned. So I hope this has been useful in helping you prepare. Um, I hope you'll um, think about perhaps joining us again next week at one or other of the events that cover the short straits and the movements through other ports on the 15th or 16th. So we will be sharing links to those through the embassies across the EU. Um, we've got a couple of finishing up slides here about keeping business moving. And I think, you know, uh, there's actions that we can all start to take on registering for the EORI numbers in the UK and the EU indeed, if you need them and elsewhere thinking about your terms and conditions, as we said, agreeing those responsibilities with others. And on our final slide, we have just um, outlined a number of useful links to you. There's the transition landing page in gov.uk that allows you to specify your type of business and where you need to go. And there's some other useful links here that we will send with slides with you. But we've been posting a lot of these in the chat. Um, I'd like to thank um, my colleagues from across the government departments for joining us this morning, despite some of the IT issues. And as they and others have said, it is a real shame that we can't be with you face to face. Um, we know how valuable these meetings can be in the in the moments between events and those opportunities to ask questions. But I hope we've covered a lot of your questions for you and pointed you in the right direction for those we haven't. Um, I'd like to uh, thank my colleagues from the embassies across uh, the British embassies across the EU who helped us to pull this together and invite you all in. And thank you all for your questions um, and uh, bearing with us through some of the IT problems. But thank you for your uh, wonderful questions and we hope we've addressed them. Perhaps we'll see some of you next week on the 15th and the 16th and um, in the meantime thank you very much for taking part in our event today and see you soon.